bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast as we continue our march towards the start of college football season. A couple of Power 5 previews already done and completed in the ACC and the Big Ten, the Pac-12 on the docket for us today. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by the two guys that really do the heavy lifting around these parts for all these preview shows, Payne Insider and Brad Powers. And gentlemen, Another power conference. Brad, this is the one that Payne circles every single offseason because we know he is a massive fan of football on the West Coast. (laughs) Well, I'm here to tell you that at least for one season, this is a legitimate conference. Uh, I mean, obviously, USC and UCLA, one last go around, uh, and obviously, USC being a legitimate team now under Lincoln Riley. But it also helps when you got Oregon State at the highest level that they've been in a couple decades. Washington's getting it rolling. Obviously, Oregon's got the most talented roster. UCLA's been in a good spot here the last couple of years under Chip Kelly. This is as strong as the Pac-12 has been in at least a decade. Payne, are you willing and able to echo those same sentiments, or is this where you cast dispersions for the next 90-plus minutes or so about the Pac-12 being soft? <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's still soft, but it's, it's the best it's been in a long while. I like everything West Coast. I, I talk to you boys both almost daily. <laughs> I trek to the West Coast. I was actually in California this uh, summer, so, you know. Broadening my horizons. Love the West Coast. Oh, here, here we go. Next thing, you're going to tell us you're a huge fan of sushi and all hell is going to break loose around these parts with you eating raw fish. 2020, 2023, gentlemen, marks the 13th and final season of the Pac-12 is currently constructed. We know that USC and UCLA are moving on to greener pastures, so to speak, joining the behemoth that will be the Big Ten. When you look at the Pac-12 from top to bottom, you can understand some of Payne's disdain, for a lack of a better term, as far as AP National Champions by current Pac-12 members are concerned. If you go back to 1936, USC has five, Colorado has one, and nobody else can claim a title crown. When you look at the conference, they've had two participants in the first nine years of the college football playoff and none over the last six. A couple of new coaches uh, in terms of programs with Arizona State bringing in Kenny Dillingham, Colorado, Deion Sanders that we know a thing or two about, and we will get to Colorado in great detail, and Stanford bringing in Troy Taylor, a bevy of transfer quarterbacks. After last year, we saw 75% of the programs operate with quarterbacks that did not start their college careers there. But Brad, before we get into Colorado, we talk all the time about the Pac-12 eliminating themselves from the college football playoff discussion, even before the calendar gets into October with the non conference schedule do you feel there are any non-conference games this year that may give them a chance to assert a level of dominance and instill some confidence and credibility in what the Pac-12 can accomplish from top to bottom yeah I mean there's certainly some opportunities We'll, we'll start you know on that opening Thursday night I mean Florida's down this year uh Utah is close to a double digit favorite at home I mean that's a game that Utah should have won last year that's a game that they absolutely have to win with the eyes of the nation you know kind of singled on that game on an opening Thursday night uh that's a must win for the conference you know the USC uh, you know it's going to be undefeated when they travel to South Bend I mean there's we'll get into it their schedule is very light but that, that, that's always a high-profile game. I, I think Oregon at Texas Tech in Week 2 is a tricky game uh, for, for Oregon that they're going to have to you know to navigate a little bit. Washington, uh, you know, the, the Boise State in the opener is a must-win for them. They also travel to East Lansing and Michigan State. I think those are the, have to be wins for a, a team that, you know like Washington that's looking to take the next step. So certainly some opportunities for, for, for the top programs, but – uh, there's a, there's always going to be in the back of your minds, uh, even up until bowl season, uh, on just how good this conference can be. It's always interesting. I mean, Payne and I have talked about for years, and I'm sure, Brad, you'd support it, that so much in college football, if you have a good head coach, you have a good quarterback, and it 
oftentimes you can mask a lot of the other deficiencies on the roster. And it feels like over the last couple of years, the Pac-12 has trended up in that particular regard. And I feel our listeners out there are going to get a rinse and repeat when we go through a number of these programs. We talk about stability, a quarterback, or at least a little bit of upside that some of these teams will be able to show every single Saturday throughout the fall. Uh, But this is a program not going to be known for stability, at least in the first year up there in Boulder. It's a program that if you follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Power 7, he has taken more shots at than any other team in the national landscape thus far. That, of course, would be the Colorado Buffaloes. And when we look at Colorado and where their win total is right now, it's a far cry from where it opened. And Brad, I'll get more on that from you in a second. But three and a half, pretty much the prevailing price tag. You do have to lay a massive number to go under. And for those folks that believe in Cinderella stories, Colorado priced upwards of 250 to one to win the Pac-12 this year. Before we get into both sides of the ball that I know you guys will cover extensively, Brad, can you pull back the curtain a little bit on what you've seen in terms of player movement for Colorado and how unsettled this situation has been as they go through a change at the top? Yeah, I mean, my most recent tweet, I didn't think it was necessarily a shot. I mean, I just circled, I highlighted all the players that are gone from the spring game that we just witnessed in, in the third week of April. And I mean, when half the entire roster is highlighted, uh, the, you know, from the spring game, I'm not talking about last year's finale against Utah. I'm talking just two months ago, 37 players missing. I mean, I was just, you know, stating the facts there. And <laughs> the facts are, this is the most turnover we've ever seen in a one-year period, less than a one-year period in college football history. So what does that do? I mean, that creates a hell of a lot of uncertainty. Uh, certainly, there's been some uncertainty in how to price this team, uh, and whether it's a win total, a week one game, game of the year lines. Uh, there's a lot of publicity, obviously. That's why we're leading with Colorado to start off this uh, preview. Uh, and I mean, a lot of for as many people that love Dion, there, there's a lot of skepticism and negativity around it. So this is the one of the lightning rod programs in college football this year. There is no doubt that Dion will be tasked with a very difficult reclamation project, so to speak. When you look at what he accomplished at Jackson State, 23 and two over the last two seasons, but he inherits a program that had the worst point differential in college football last year at minus 29.1. Four losses versus ranked opponents were by an average of 41 plus points, and they were 0 and 11 when they allowed more than 21 points in a game. You look at their point differentials, minus 349, 32.4 average margin of defeat was 130th in the country. Turnover margin margin of minus 11, not very good either. Points off turnover margin, minus 84, 130th. And total yards margin, they gave up 2,742 more yards than they accumulated offensively, which was last in the country. Brad, offensively, they made some moves in terms of the portal, obviously, to bring in difference makers. But one of the biggest ones was being able to lure a head coach from your beloved Mid-American Conference in Sean Lewis out to Boulder to take over the offense, knowing that the goal, obviously, for Deion and company is to play at a breakneck pace and hope Shador Sanders can be that guy that allows Colorado to show some big play potential. Yeah, of all the hype and publicity of the 50 transfers, uh, you know, Dion uh, bringing his son, Shador, we'll talk about him in a second. I, I think the one that's probably gone a little bit too unnoticed, which I thought was one of uh, Sanders' best moves, was hiring Sean Lewis, the, the former Kent State head coach, to be his offensive coordinator. I mean, you look at the record that Sean Lewis had in five years at Kent State, you're not going to be wild, but I'm here to tell you, uh, when you're playing like last year, you're playing Oklahoma, Washington, and Georgia in the non-conference, you're not going to have a winning record at a place like Kent State, uh, one of the bottom programs in the MAC. So I thought he did a tremendous job. I think he's one of the brighter mind, offensive minds in all of college football. Uh, he runs you know, the, the, a very quick tempo. Uh, it's been one of the more productive offenses in college football the last couple of years. Quick passes, eliminates the, the negative plays, which I think fits perfectly for how the, this roster is going to be at least constructed this season with some issues on the offensive line. So uh, I thought it was one of the more underrated hires in all of college football this offseason. Prime getting Sean Lewis. Big get for him. Uh, speaking of big gets, Shadour, uh, Deion's son, comes over from Jackson State with him. Very productive, obviously 
obviously. Uh, you're talking about a kid that, you know, very accurate, careful with the football, 40 touchdowns, six interceptions, completed 70% of his passes. Uh, Going to be a major step up, though, from a lower-level FCS conference to a legitimate Power 5 conference. But watching the spring game, I, he looked apart to me. I mean, I certainly had my questions and concerns, you know, the nepotism and whatnot. But uh, 6'2", 215, built well. Can run, but I don't expect them to run him too much, mainly because the, if there's, you know, one of the positions that, that doesn't have much depth is the quarterback position. He's got true freshmen backing him up. So I don't expect to see too much quarterback run from Shador. Uh, let's talk running backs, though. I, I You talk about portal. They did a good job in the portal. Cavassier Smoke from Kentucky, a productive, you know, four-year career at Kentucky, over 1,500 career yards. Alton McCaskill was a late get post-spring from Houston. We'll see if he's fully healthy from tearing an ACL last year, but that was a kid that really flashed as a true freshman for Houston two years ago. Kid I like out of the, the recruiting class is Dylan Edwards, a kid that – Coach Prime was able to flip from Notre Dame, a jitterbug kid, 5'9", 165, very fast. Uh, I expect him to, to get him out in space. I think if there's one position that they're really excited about, it's probably wide receiver. Uh, I mean, when you looked at uh, – the good thing about what's been happening in Colorado this offseason – man, have you been able to get a pull behind, behind the curtain on this program. I mean, as much behind-the-scenes coverage as I've seen yep. – any college football. And if they're if you're following along during spring with all the practices and whatnot, I would say Jimmy Horn was maybe the most impressive, at least early on in spring, the last you know, first five, ten practices. He was the first player to, you know, to get his number. That was a big deal that this spring. He's a transfer from USF. Uh, another transfer from USF, Xavier Weaver comes in. He had a very productive career. Travis Hunter. Uh, going to play, I mean, supposedly going to play both ways. I mean, Payne will get into it. I'm not sure he's got the body type to play both ways at the Power 5 level, but I'm sure to satisfy him a little bit, they're going to start him a little bit at wide receiver. They do lose a couple of wide receivers for, that, that, that I thought were some of their better players from last year. The Tyson kid went to Arizona State. I mean, he averaged 21 and a half yards per catch last year on a bad team. That was pretty impressive. If you watch the spring game, Montana, Montana Limonius Craig was a star of the spring game. He transferred out post spring. So those are a couple of losses there. But if there's one concern I have on the offense still, it's the offensive line. And I just don't, I'm not sure that they have quality depth there. The Roddick kid was probably their best offensive lineman last year. He transferred to Florida State. Had to hear about him during uh, the dinner with Payne a, a few weeks ago uh, on how he can make an impact there among many of Florida State's transfers. <laughs> uh, Van Wells is back, uh, but, but they're going to be relying on. What worries me is this. Looks like a lot of their projected starters on the offensive line are going to be from Kent State, a pair of kids that Sean Lewis brought over from there. Sure, they know the system, but again, they're going from Kent State to Colorado, and we're talking. We're going to talk about how good this Pac-12 conference is, and it is a tough schedule for Colorado this year. How do they perform? Jackson State, they brought in a transfer there that might start. A Missouri State kid from the FCS level. So I, I'm just not sure how good this offensive line can be. But overall, I mean, with the transfers they bring in, with a very good offensive coordinator, I significantly upgraded this offense. I mean, plus six points from, from a year ago. You know, Payne, Brad mentions Travis Hunter. We know his flirtations during his is recruiting out of high school, all the thought was that he was going to end up in Garnet and Gold, ends up following Deanna Jackson State, and of course to Colorado now. Charles Kelly steps in as the defensive coordinator formerly of Alabama, and he inherits a defense that may have been worse than Colorado's offense, allowing more than 44 points per game, which was the worst in the FBS. They lost 10 games by 20 plus points last season. They were last in rushing yards allowed, 130th in yards per game, 130th in yards per play, nine total sacks, which was dead last in the FBS, and third down defense had them ranked dead last is there hope for salvation for Colorado because this is a stop unit that doesn't just go from miserable to average it's just go from miserable to horrific and it still seems like it would be a stride in the right direction I think you know Brad actually said something astute at the very top and it's all of the players coming and going right like I we tracked it as 51 new players heading to Boulder and then over 70 players leaving in the last 11 months so for me like metrics and regression and progression like none of that matters yep because you know virtually nothing remains it's all about looking forward and figuring out what Colorado is now you mentioned Charles Kelly he is a damn good 
defensive coordinator. I thought it was another fantastic hire. He does come over from Alabama. He's an absolute maniac, but the man can coach. He can recruit. (laughs) He has two national titles, one with Florida State, so I'm pretty familiar there. He likes to be multiple with his defense, but I'm not sure he has the depth or uh, you know the chess pieces to do that in year one. From what I am hearing internally over there, the starting lineup is going to look like this. It's Derek McClendon at end. I think he's a good upgrade for Colorado. Fifth-year guy, slightly above replacement level. He's physical. He can set the edge. I know he's looking to improve his stock with more reps. He was going to be FSU's fourth end in their rotation. Jordan Dominic is making his third stop in six seasons. He's going to be the other bookend for Colorado. Coming off a pretty nice season in the SEC, recorded a pressure run stop on 11% of snaps. Inside, you have Leonard Payne Jr. comes over from Fresno, had his best season last year. He's going to start it at nose guard. You have the Dartmouth transfer, Shane Cokes. He's going to be on the interior as well. They're saying He'll be the defensive captain, more of a three-tech, a little undersized, but generated a pressure or a run stop on more than 11% of snaps. I do wonder, you know, you go from Dartmouth to, to the P5 level, how that transition looks. I think a lot of people will talk about Taj Alston from West Virginia, but he's been, you know, replacement level at best for four seasons. And then something we talked about a little bit off air is all of the hype around recruits and what that means to team sites with clicks and views and and Dion likes to create buzz and you know that that in turn you know creates some of those those clicks Savelle Smalls transfers in everyone reports it as a five-star recruit that was the case in 2020 uh but there's a reason you know a kid from Washington leaves a Washington program heading in the right direction and it's you know three straight seasons of replacement level or below play linebacker is going to be some combination of Kennedy Brown Bentley and Gant Kennedy is an Alabama kid so he's coming over with Charles Kelly didn't see the field much for the tide Bentley comes in from Clemson he was a backup right who's played 400 snaps or so in four seasons graded above replacement level last year Brendan Gant from FSU interesting kid he's an ace special teamer more of a sub package coverage linebacker because he's a converted safety and then Brown joins Dion from Jackson State he's got the most snap experience at linebacker of this group but again making that leap from a low level FCS program to the to the P5 level corner is Travis Hunter And you have the true freshman, Cormani McLean, Silman Craig at one safety spot. And at the other, you have the lone returning starter for Colorado, Trevor Woods. I have a hard time believing Miles Slusher won't get some burn as well. The collection of players is just wild, right? Like the starting D-line is laced with solid, experienced players kind of looking to prove themselves in expanded roles or against better competition depth I think is a concern on the interior of the D-line three linebackers right are coming from better P5 schools because they couldn't be a factor or break the starting lineup the secondary again it's like two young inexperienced kids that haven't played at this level and I know Brad took a subtle shot but both of them treat the weight room like a disease so you know through the roof potential So I'm just, you know, I'm interested to see what Travis Hunter is from what I hear. You know, he took the easy way, could have transferred to Georgia this go around and played for Kirby, who does nothing but send defensive players to the first round of the draft instead. Right. You know, his size probably won't be exposed as much in the Pac-12 and then he can do as he pleases. Little accountability. And and as Brad alluded to, plenty of time for YouTube videos. So that seems to be the priority. (laughs) I didn't Uh, allude to that. Well, you said they have great coverage. They have great coverage. You can get a, you you know, you can get an in-depth look at Colorado because, you know, YouTube's the focus over there. Um, I know most people saw ESPN highlights when Hunter would make a play and you go back and actually watch the Alcorn State game. It was ugly. Like the, the interception makes ESPN, but it's like this, you know, uh, across the body, across the hash, flutter, you know, pick six. But then if you actually watch the full game, Hunter was out physical at the point of attack on jump balls like four or five times in that game. So, you know, this is going to be a challenge. You, you look at the schedule, four top 25 offenses are on Colorado's schedule. And then aside from uh, Colorado State and Stanford, every other offense that Colorado's defense is going to face projects inside the top 65 for us so you're looking at 10 out of 12 weeks 
our projection indicates opposing offenses are going to have an advantage over Colorado's defense. So I think it's it's going to be tough sledding in year one, but that's to be expected. I think, you know, we love the OC and DC hires, and it's clear Colorado's going to recruit at a higher level. So, I mean, this is just year one. I, I think, you know, it's probably a, a bright future ahead. Last thing on the Buffaloes, Brad, I'll come to you. In terms of their win total, where you saw it open versus where it sits right now, can you walk us through a little bit of the progression? Because my gut tells me you had a hand in going under one of the biggest numbers we saw out in the market a couple months ago. Yeah, so, I mean, fun prop market was when Dion was hot, first hired back in December. You know, Offshore Book posted five and a half. Uh, I wish they had a bet, a bet, allowed me to bet a lot more than they were allowing at that time on under five and a half. But what was available earlier this spring was four and a half. Uh, went under there as well. So I mean, we have some, you know, some value. I would still, you know, three and a half under juice to, to me is a pretty fair number. Uh, I guess I am being overly negative, but I would still lean under three and a half. So we, we have seen, despite all the hype and hubbub and, you know, one book reporting that they're, they got as many, you know, future, uh, they, they, their term was liability on Colorado National Championship liability. But with all that hubbub, I mean, we've seen uh, the, the, the pros go under their win total and, and not expecting much from, from this year's team. And, and I, I'm here to say, though, it's not like I'm overly negative. I have upgraded Colorado as much as any team in my power ratings I still can only get them to like a three and nine type of season Colorado will figure out exactly what this Buffaloes team looks like as the season progresses as they try and fit together a bunch of disjointed pieces as far as Colorado and their postseason expectations Oregon's very different they on the flip side of the coin want to win the Pac-12 and potentially compete for a national title in Dan Lanning's second season in Eugene you look at Oregon's win total right around the nine and a half threshold they find themselves a shade less than three to one to win the league this year they did have their first bowl victory since 2019 coming again against a beleaguered UNC side last year. Won 10 games for the third straight non-COVID season. When you look at what Lanning was able to accomplish, became the first Oregon head coach since Mark Helfrich back in 2013 to win 10 games in his first season. As far as their schedule this year, this is a group that'll play on the road against Washington and Utah. They'll host USC in the span of five games. And Lanning had some interesting comments coming out of the spring addressing his depth, but I'll defer to you guys for some of the takeaways there. In steps Will Stein to serve as offensive coordinator coming over from UTSA as Kenny Dillingham, now the head coach down in Tempe, leading the Arizona State Sun Devils. But the biggest coup pain for Oregon and this offense during the offseason was retaining the services of Bo Nix for his 37th year in college. <laughs> and unfortunately for them, it meant that the talented quarterback Dante Moore elected to go elsewhere in the Pac-12. When you look at Oregon's offense, Bo Nix showed us flashes last year, but a lot of that, in my opinion, had to do with Kenny Dillingham, the same offensive coordinator that had recruited him to Auburn years ago. Yeah, and I think that's probably why Moore did not commit to Oregon as well because of Kenny Dillingham. I, Will Stein comes over from UTSA, spent a season there as the co-OC and QB coach, and as much as I liked what UTSA did offensively the last few seasons, I don't really know if Will Stein you know, was the the developer of that. It was very much already in place when he took the reins. I think this is a little bit of a leap, but it's, you know, wait and see for me, whereas I just, I knew what I was getting with Kenny Dillingham, right? It's why we were bullish on the Ducks offense last season. I knew the relationship that, you know, Dilly and Bo had dating back to high school. And if you look, Bo Nix had his best season ever. Oregon finished top five in schedule adjusted passing success rate, top 10 in explosive passing. Bo himself graded out the 13th best power five quarterback and would have been significantly higher had he not gutted out a high ankle sprain late in the season. Will Stein has said multiple times that he's not changing much offensively and Dan Lanning's doubled down and said like that's why he hired Will Stein because he wanted that offensive continuity. Let's just kind of see if that's the case. The Ducks O-line is interesting to me. It was a unit that allowed five sacks all last season, best in the country, was top 10 in Havoc allowed, and then they created rushing yards at a top 30 rate. Prior to watching Oregon spring game, I knew they were replacing three NFL guys, Alex Forsyth, TJ Bass, and then Laulu. Um, one of the projected starters this season was Marcus Harper. He suffered an injury in spring. Let's see what his availability is for fall. 
for the spring game, there was a decent amount of heat on the quarterbacks and not a ton of running lanes to be had. So that's something to to monitor, I feel like. Powers Johnson, he returns. I think he's the Ducks' best and most versatile lineman. It's possible that he becomes the anchor of the line at center. You have Junior Junior Anguilla comes over from Texas. We like him. I think we've mentioned him a few times in, in the Big 12 previews we've done. Been a solid guard for three seasons. Can play on the left or right side, but grades out better on the right. Then you have the four-star tackle. Uh, Johnny Cornelius transfers in from Rhode Island. He's going to start at right tackle. The Ducks beat out Ohio State for his services. I'm interested to see, again, what that transition looks like from Rhode Island to the Pac-12. Word is Josh Connerly Jr., the number one O-line recruit in the 2022 class, made huge strides this spring. He's going to start at left tackle. Then you have other guys like Stephen Jones and Strother, and if Harper is healthy, we'll kind of battle and fall for some starting jobs. I do see some regression from the o-line but it's still going to be a plus group bucky irving might be you know good enough to make up for the dip in o-line play he was the third most elusive back in college football with at least 150 rushing attempts and then you look at his like size and stature you know like 5 10 190 pounds somehow he averages 4.4 yards after first contact graded out the sixth best back in the country receiver room has a lot of options troy franklin is continuing to grow um, and and take his game to the next level is the word out of spring averaged over 2.3 yards per route run last year you bring in Treshawn Holden from Alabama four-star kid he's been a plus player I think he could probably emerge if the drop rate decreases 14 percent drop rate last season but a big you know body guy 6'3 215 Chris Hudson is still around he's solid Tez Johnson is a name I think that we should probably be thinking about a little bit more. He's a home run threat, transfers in from Troy. Bo Nix's family actually adopted Tez, made a ridiculous play in the spring game. I think he's going to just get more burn than people are projecting. Averaged three and a half yards per route run at Troy last season, graded out among the nation's best. And then you got two young kids, Jurion Dickey, the number two receiver in the 23 class. He was recovering from a spring injury. Maybe he's a late season contributor. And then Kyler Casper receiving a ton of praise. So my vibe with Oregon's receiver room is like there's good established talent to start the season. Then maybe by year's end, you know, you get Dickey and Casper really elevating that room schedule. Oregon's offense won't face a single top 25 defense by our projections in totality. The 12 defenses Oregon's going to face this year have an average efficiency rank of 75. So I think it's another (laughs) big season for the Ducks offense. Not quite sure it's top five in rushing and passing, but I don't think there's a large dip happening unless, you know, Will Stein really struggles here. Well, a lot of reason to be optimistic about what the Ducks can do week in, week out in terms of putting up crooked numbers. But if this team is not only going to compete for a conference championship and get themselves in the national championship race, they're going to have to hold up their end of the bargain on the defensive side as well. When you look at Oregon a season ago, Brad, the pass rush was one of the biggest areas of concern. I mean, they weren't able to generate pressure at all, and it really showed up on the back end where some of the numbers they gave up defensively for their secondary in the passing game... um, Uh, would leave the most devout Oregon fans out there absolutely turning away when they had to watch that side of the ball. But as a result, they go to the power of the portal. They try and bring in a number of faces to upgrade that talent level and hope that they can mask some of those deficiencies. When you look at Oregon defensively, can they do enough to take that leap to allow this Oregon team to be much more complete in 2023 than what we saw in 2022? So Payne used the word wait and see uh, a few times when he was talking about, you know, transition from Dillingham to Stein. I'm also kind of in a wait and see mode on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, power ratings wise, I got him a little bit flat with last year. You would expect improvement when you mentioned their struggles, particularly on the back end. And when you can't generate pressure, they only had 18 sacks. That was the fewest at Oregon in more than three decades. It really exposed the secondary. They're number 108 in pass success rate a year ago. Uh, so, so what was the issue? Because, I mean, that is Dan Lanning's forte. That side of the ball is his specialty. 
uh, what went wrong. You know, I can't say talent was an issue when, when, when you had four guys drafted off the defense a year ago. I mean, Gonzalez goes in the first round at cornerback. Uh, DJ Johnson was a third rounder, and he was their best pass rusher. Sua, linebacker, very talented kid. probably been their best linebacker the last couple of seasons. They had a big defensive tackle drafted. Their leading tackler's gone. So they do lose quite a bit of talent from last year's defense. You mentioned it, though. Not only do they have some guys returning, 12 of the 18 players, you saw 200-plus snaps return. Uh, keep in mind, Oregon's also signed the best recruiting class in the Pac-12 five straight years. So there's talent there. But even with that, they still went into the portal, dipped in significantly. Uh, when you look at the, you know, the, the linebacker, uh, Justin Jacobs from Iowa, uh, uh, Soeli from uh, the Arizona State, Alabama, uh, the, you know, Kyrie Jackson from Alabama at cornerback, a Colorado kid at cornerback, uh, the Nichols probably going to be a, a, an old Miss kid, Tysheem Johnson. Uh, I think one of the better uh, did transfers that they got us from Fresno State at safety. Evan Williams has 200 plus tackles in his career. So they really dipped into the portal quite significantly, particularly in the secondary. And speaking of the secondary, uh, they have a new co-DC. Uh, now, I think his forte is going to be mainly based in the secondary. Is Chris Hampton from Tulane. That's where his experience level's been. It's not like Tosh Lupoy has gone anywhere. It's not like Dan Lanning's going to be completely hands-off laissez-faire with the defense. I expect them to still have a lot of say, but I thought they brought in Hampton to, to shore up a little bit of that back end, and they certainly had to but in the transfer portal. One thing I do like, and watching the spring game, and Payne brought this up, because keep in mind, this was an Oregon team that it was a disaster in the opener last year against Georgia. I mean, this was a defense that had 29 missed tackles. What did I see throughout the course of the season? I mean, it got a little bit better, but man, in the spring game, the open field tackling was much better. The, the run, running lanes were closed up completely. Uh, the defensive line, a lot of experience there. The doorless kid had nine and a half tackles uh, for loss uh, a year ago. They get a big, uh, the, the nose tackle pop, uh, who was injured last year, 315 pounds. He comes back. Casey Rogers is back at defensive tackle. Yet another transfer. Uh, I think may, one of their more talented transfers they bring in is Jordan Birch from South Carolina. He's not going to have to play as many snaps as South Carolina relied on him a year ago, so I, I expect him to be a pretty good pass rusher. Speaking of that, if there was a couple guys that stood out to me in the spring game, was a couple of pass rushers. Uh, Mace, uh, Masi Funa at edge, and then I, you know, the, the true freshman, uh, Uwe Angelale's brother, uh, Matayo, a high four-star true freshman kid. He popped to me and flashed in the spring game. So th th there's certainly a lot to work with here from not only a talent uh, aspect, but bringing a lot of experience from the transfer portal. They shouldn't have an issue when, with regards to coaching, in my opinion. So uh, even with all the losses, I mean, they're certainly going to rely on the offense. This is more of an offensive-driven team still this year. And then, you know, Payne likes to bring up the schedule. As beneficial as it is on for the Oregon offense as far as not facing quality defenses, the opposite uh, is true for, for this Oregon defense where they're going to face a ton uh, of solid to great offenses. And even in non-conference, the Texas Tech offense is really going to challenge them in week two. And then you start going through the gauntlet when, when you're facing the USC's, the Washington's of the world, the Utah very well-balanced offense. So... I'm not expecting a drastic improvement from this defense So when you start looking at the counting stat, uh, stats at the end of the year. You mentioned that schedule, and you highlighted the game against Texas Tech in Lubbock the second week of the season. That appears to be their only test, theoretically, before their bye week that comes in week six. And that's when we'll get a much better indication of exactly what Oregon is going to be week in, week out. You look at that stretch right after at Washington, home against Washington State, at Utah, home against Cal, USC, and they'll finish on the road at Arizona State before wrapping up with their Civil War rival in the Oregon State Beavers, which leads us directly into our Oregon State breakdown and Jonathan Smith, who enters... <coughs> excuse me, his sixth year at the helm in Corvallis, a stadium at Reister Stadium for anybody that watched Oregon State football over the last couple of years that looked more like a reclamation and construction project than anything else. <laughs> but it speaks to the money that they're putting into this program, and it's contributed to much better on-field results. When you look at the Beavers' win total at 8.5, <clears throat> 
shaded to the under right around 10 to 1 to win the conference this year I hearken back to the first regular season show we did last year Brad came on to this very show with slander for Jonathan Smith took shots at my beloved Beavers was made to eat a little bit of crow so we'll get to Brad's breakdown of this team defensively in a minute but you look at what Oregon State accomplished 10 wins for the third time in program history the first time since 2006 last year they finished ranked for the first time since 2012 and they were 10 and 0 when they scored 24 plus points in a game two of their three losses were by three points total out of the 105 years of playing college football this is a program that has had just 42 winning seasons so it hasn't exactly been a gold standard up there in the Pacific Northwest but you look at Jonathan Smith finally giving them stability we know what he accomplished as a player there but Payne when we talk about Jonathan Smith and his background as a quarterback this has the opportunity to be one of the most interesting position groups not just for Oregon State this year but maybe in the conference when you look at what they've done to upgrade the talent in Corvallis Ben Branson was their guy last year high floor but very low ceiling you bring in DJU coming in from Clemson hoping to resurrect his college career but maybe the most intriguing prospect of all is Aiden Childs whose elusiveness was on full display during the spring he showed that level of athleticism first question for you do we assume that DJ is given the reins to be the starting quarterback this year or do you think it's very much an open competition like the coaches would lead you to believe going into fall camp it's DJ's job I I fully believe that Um, you know you mentioned what Jonathan Smith's been able to do here and one he just he loves the program right that's why he came back that's why he's really putting his all into fixing this I love some of the staff members that he's hired building this back up I know Florida State plucked one of his guys off in Derek Ray uh, about a year ago and he's been awesome for Florida State just does not get enough credit nationally for turning you know a one and eleven dumpster fire into a competitive program that's off back to back winning seasons and just won ten games for the third time in program history. The only reason we're talking Beavers football right now is because of Jonathan Smith. The big get is DJU, and you know he's a former number one quarterback. Now he's a four star transfer. I know everyone's down on him, but I think there's a couple things to look at when you properly gauge that situation. And the first one is like what's DJ coming from and as great as Clemson is I think the answer is you know probably astoundingly dog shit when talking about offensive scheme like we don't think much of Tony Elliott as an offensive mind right he ran Clemson's offense into the ground he's going to make Virginia irrelevant soon enough and then there's a reason Dabo they may already be there by the way yeah I I think I think so (laughs) I think so like you know oof and then and then we know Brandon Streeter got fired this offseason And if you've listened to DJ come out recently, he never said it in the moment while he was there. He's very respectful, but he came out and was, you know, pretty candid, but said it professionally that he wasn't fond of what Clemson did schematically, thought the scheme was basic and didn't play to his strengths. And that's a report per Bruce Feldman. So like right off the bat, you're going to see DJ, he's going to be more multiple. He's not going to live in shotgun 98% of snaps like at at Clemson. He's going to be under center half the time. He mentioned route trees being more diverse at Oregon State. Now, you know, there needs to be some you know, self-awareness and accountability because DJ needs to be better. He didn't play to a number one quarterback recruit level, but he quietly improved. I mean, last offseason, we talked about him dropping bad weight and being more mobile. Average nearly 3.2 yards per rush after first contact was well above replacement level as a mobile quarterback. And then as a passer, adjusted accuracy improved nearly 5% season over season, went from less than a one-to-one touchdown to interception ratio to more than a three-to-one touchdown to interception ratio. If you look at his pure QB grade, went from slightly better than replacement level to an 80 right 60 is replacement level so I think that's the first part of the equation the second part is you know what was Oregon State's quarterback room last season when we're gauging potential improvement I think the easy answer is like Oregon State dealt with injuries to the position right Chance Nolan was their guy to start the season got injured and then comes Ben Goldbrinson and he just graded out you know, outside the top 100 quarterbacks that I had at least 200 dropbacks in. And he's a pocket statue. You mentioned Aiden Childs, four-star quarterback from California. He was the seventh best in the 23 class. And I think he's absolutely, you know, going to be quarterback two by the end of the season. And I think his potential is, is endless. He is a freak athlete. He looked like he was on a different level in the spring game. Up front, 
You have to love what Oregon State returns. Four of five offensive linemen are back. It's one of the best units in the Pac-12. And you just look like it's a run-first team, and a lot of those guys up front are just great and run-blocking. Jake Levengood, one of the best anchors in the country. You have Fuaga, one of the conference's best tackles. Joshua Gray is an elite run-blocker at left tackle. And then Bloomfield at left guard is coming off his best season while he upgraded conferences. So that was a breath of fresh air. Sometimes, again, we talk about this when you're going up in conference the play doesn't remain the same it was good to see that that the Pac-12 wasn't a shock to his system and then at right guard you know that's where the battle lies Brewer was out during spring recovering from a knee surgery uh, that he he uh, suffered and then you have Grant Stark who was I believe a three-star transfer recruit out of Nevada so let's see who wins that job and then you know, you got one of the best running backs in the country and Damian Martinez over three and a half yards after first contact. I like Jim Griffin as a as a number two was really elusive last season. And so, like, I'm not projecting any regression for Oregon State's run game. It was top 20 in both success rate and EPA and defenses could cheat run because Gold Branson wasn't much of a threat through the air. Wide receivers and pass catchers in general feel like a question mark. That's been the case, I think, multiple seasons now. Silas Bolden is the breakout candidate, and all the rave during spring had a great catch during the spring game. Anthony Gould is the speedster over two and a half yards per route run. And then Jake Velling at tight end is a guy the staff is extremely high on. Missed spring, recovering from surgery, but internally, they believe Velling could be like their next great tight end, a Luke Musgrove type. Schedule is soft when thinking about the Pac-12 being really solid this season. Oregon State's going to face one defense we're projecting in the top 30. Altogether, the Beavers start with you know three non-con games that aren't overly daunting. You avoid USC, you get Utah and Washington at home, and then you have two of the easiest opponents in the Pac-12 relative to market on the schedule with with Colorado and Stanford so I think this team has the opportunity you know with a bowl win to maybe get to 10 wins again I mean Brad we talk all the time about head coaches and how their team should reflect their DNA so Oregon State building an offense over the last couple of years with a pulse I don't think should come as a massive surprise albeit it was a slow burn for Jonathan Smith to instill that level of culture Payne highlighted an offensive line that's filled with road graders paving the way for running backs and we've seen a number of them go out there and perform over the last couple of years but for me as optimistic as I was about Oregon State going into last year I never envisioned a defense doing what they were able to accomplish under Trent Bray's leadership. Leading the league in scoring for the first time since 2000, they closed out the campaign allowing 10 points or fewer in five of the last seven games, stopped the run at an elite level and limited yard per play numbers. They were t- t- It's tough to finish number one in the nation in red zone defense and first in the league against the run when you lose five of your top seven tacklers coming back. As far as this stop unit and their ability to pick up where they left off, suffice to say some regression should be expected, but how precipitous do you see a potential drop-off when it comes to Oregon State's ability to rinse and repeat what they did on the defensive side last season? Yeah, I'm certainly worried uh, because this isn't a, yet a, a plug-and-play program, at least on the defensive side of the ball. And you talked about a build on the offense side of the ball. There's been a build on the defense side of the ball. You talked about the numbers last year leading the the Pac-12 in total defense, rushing defense. I mean, what Jonathan Smith inherited was the worst defense in the conference back to his first season in 2018. And, and the guy that should get a lot of the credit – uh, obviously Jonathan Smith for hiring him uh, middle of the season in 2021 but Trent Bray the defensive coordinator uh, took over the defense the final four games uh, of 2021 the defense saw improvement almost immediately it kind of reminded me this is in the weeds but very similar to what you know Joe Rossi did at Minnesota several years ago got hired like four or five games left in the season immediate improvement and away he went uh, and then last season was his first full season. We saw how good the defense was. Now, now the, the reason being that I think there's going to be a drop-off is the loss of production. I mean, especially in the secondary. And when you lose three of your top four guys, Alex Austin was drafted, uh, Jane Grant, very productive, uh, Wright, uh, uh, to me, you know, a great build. I'm surprised he didn't get drafted, but he was productive. Linebacker Fisher Morris is gone. And then, you know, a, a big transfer out of the program. 
Omar Spates, a linebacker, one of their best linebackers the last couple of years. I actually think he's going to be really good at LSU, so that's a name to keep an eye out for at the SEC level. But he's gone from them. Uh, I think their emotional leader in the locker room, um, you know, an old everything utility guy, Jack Coletto, who, who played some linebacker, uh, he's gone. Uh, so th- there is – some concerns there and who they're going to replace all those guys with. I'll start on the defensive line. If there is some hope uh, that they can continue from what they were a year ago, I think they're okay at the defensive line. You mentioned, yeah, they got really good counting stats as far as, you know, the, the, the rushing yards per game allowed, but not overly, you know, a, a team that's going to be uh, create a lot of havoc as far as sacks and tackles for loss. But the guy to keep an eye out that, that did have some good production was uh, Rawls on the defensive line, had 11 run stops, nine and a half TFLs last year. Productive. He had at least one TFL in each of his last seven games. So very consistent there. They did hit the transfer portal to, to maybe, you know, bolster that pass rush a little bit. They bring in a kid from Wyoming, uh, Omatosho, who had six and a half sacks a year ago. Watching the spring game, it wasn't a good look just the way. I mean, they were, I mean, the Pac-12 network was so focused on, you know, sideline interviews. I, I mean, I, I want to see the game. I don't want to see, you know, former players on the sideline. Come on. Uh, you know, Nico Taylor was come, a Come on, Brad. You know you were excited about them interviewing Steven Jackson, Derek Anderson, and everybody else that's come through that program along the way. <laughs> You know, I'm okay with, you know, some of the hoopla and if you want to promote the the program and whatnot, but I don't care about players that, that, that played 10 years ago. I really don't. Uh, I mean, that was just an Oregon State issue. I mean, I see this all the time in the spring games. When you watch 60 of them like I do each year, you, you develop some uh, – uh, let's just say some habits and, <laughs> and stuff you don't like, some pet peeves. Uh, I don't mind like two years ago that they showed them blowing up the stadium. I mean, the former stadium, <laughs> that was kind of cool. That I don't mind. Back to business, though. Nico Taylor, it was a kid that impressed me in the spring game. I think he can be productive off the edge. They bring in a transfer at linebacker and C.J. Hart. Uh, another linebacker to keep an eye on that, that Smith is high on in this Mascarin, this Arnold kid who had five and a half TFLs a year ago. I mentioned the secondary losing a lot of production. Definitely three of their top four players. If there was one guy, though, that really stood out to me, rewatching games from a year ago, a kid I think will be drafted this upcoming year, Oladapo at free safety. Just looks the part. 6'1", 212. He can come up and stop the run, defend the pass. He bends well. He runs well. Just a really good-looking prospect uh, that, that, again, I think will get drafted a year ago. So at least they have something to work with in the back end. Uh, Payne mentioned the schedule and yeah I I think uh, you know obviously we we got five six teams that are legitimate here I mean I got six teams in the Pac-12 in my top 30 in my power ratings but if there's one team of the favorites that got a beneficial schedule and draw it's Oregon State and uh, because of what I expect to be the offense improvements with, with better quarterback play even with some regression on this defensive side of the ball I wasn't afraid to walk up to the window and bet over eight wins. So I'm expecting it to be another very successful season in Corvallis. You know, circle the date on the calendar. Week five, a Friday night game that could showcase two teams inside the top 10 if things break the right way. Obviously, Utah has some work to do, but the Utes will come into Corvallis for a game that should really define exactly what this Oregon State team can be, assuming that they're able to take care of business the week before on the road at Pullman. My biggest takeaway, though, from this Oregon State breakdown is when you're showing a spring game, it means less TJ Hushmanzada on the sidelines and more Silas Bolden <laughs> catching punts if your intention is to keep Brad Powers happy. And, of course, you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers 7 You can follow Payne there as well at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. Uh, and most importantly, though, as always, for all things Bet the Board, follow the Bet the Board podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Gentlemen, from the Pacific Northwest into Southern California, and it's the UCLA Bruins will see a changing of the guard. Gone is the familiar face in Dorian Thompson Robinson, who exhausts his eligibility. Their win total sits at eight and a half, heavily shaded to the under. But if you look at their price to win the Pac-12, right around 17 to one. Nine wins are the most in Chip Kelly's five years in Westwood and most for the program since 2014 when they went 10-3. and Last year, they were 
eight and zero when they allowed less than thirty four points. One and four when that threshold was crossed. They did start six and zero before finishing three and four over their final seven games. However, they finished the season ranked for the first time since two thousand fourteen. But they are still in pursuit of that first conference title since nineteen ninety eight. What's very interesting when you talk about Bruins spring football, it was a no fan, no fun zone as described by some of the reporters close to the program. No inner squad game was played. Two players or assistant coaches selected seemingly at random, trotted out for short interviews after each of the 15 practices. So Brad, for a guy that watches all the spring games, is this a better result so you don't have to worry about plays you missed? Or how frustrating is it when you want to get a first look at what UCLA is dealing with in their starting quarterback room? Frustrated because I mean you want to see Dante more, uh, you know, a much heralded, ballyhooed, you know, freshman recruit coming in. I mean, their highest rated recruit, uh, you know, on the offense side of the ball in the history of the school. So, I would have liked to seen da- Dante more in all the transfers. Uh, so it was. It was frustrating not to see that, Todd. (laughs) You mentioned uh, Dante Moore and what will be expected there. Clearly no indication yet of exactly who will be the week one starter for UCLA. But when you look at what this offense accomplished last year, they do return a significant amount of starting production from an offense that Average 39 points per game, which was eighth in F- the FBS, 503 yards per game, which was fourth in the country. When you go back to 2000, UCLA hadn't led the Pac-12 in rushing yards per game before doing so a season ago. And the numbers behind Zach Charbonnet, over 3,000 rushing yards, 238 per contest, six yards per carry, and 36 rushing touchdowns. But we joke about Dorian Thompson-Robinson and how difficult it was to try and figure him out on a week-in, week-out basis. But this is a guy who it was an all-time leader in starts with four and passing touchdowns at 88. So when you look at this quarterback room, Brad, Colin Schley from Kent State comes in, Ethan Garbers knows the offense, Chase Griffin, and of course the aforementioned Dante Moore. Yeah, so significant downgrade for me uh, on offense for UCLA, at least at the start of the season until some of these guys get some experience and they gel. I mean, for as inconsistent as DTR was, uh, I mean, very highly productive. We're talking about the all-time leader in the history of the school as far as total offense. You mentioned it. Started 48 games. I wish he wouldn't have started the bowl game uh, <laughs> on second review. <laughs> that one, I wish you would have sat out. I know there was all that hoopla. Is he going to play or is he not going to play? After watching what he did in the red zone, I wish he wouldn't have played that game against Pitt. Uh, my bankroll would have thanked him for it. Uh, <laughs> let's talk Chip Kelly, though. I mean, there was just a couple of years ago you now has the game passed chip kelly by i mean 10 15 years ago he was the you know the, the hottest mind on the offense side of the ball in college football it had it passed him by and i'm here to tell you it hasn't yet i mean when you look at some of the more advanced uh, analytics out there i mean they were first in the country in epa rush last year second in rushing success rate will they be as that good this year Probably not. Not only you're losing a mobile quarterback in DTR, but I mean, let's face it, Zach Charbonnet uh, was a very productive running back the last couple of years. Goes in the second round. He, in fact, he was the all-purpose leader in college football a year ago. When you look at rushing and receiving yards, so that that's a major loss for them. Uh, a quarterback, you know, it's kind of a wait and see. I know it's going to be a downgrade. It, I wish I could have seen a spring game to, to, to get a better little bit vantage point uh, if Dante Moore is going to be ready right off the bat. I think he's going to end up being the starter by the end of the season. But if I had to guess, at least right now, I, I'm thinking Ethan Garbers, believe it or not, just been in the program. He's got a couple of starts under his belt. Uh, highest floor, at least to start the, se- the season, Not certainly not the highest ceiling. Uh, they bring in Schley from Kent State, very productive, dual threat type of get kid. I'm not sure. I think he'll end up getting lost in the mix when it's all said and done. I do want to mention Dante Moore, though. I mean, I've been watching the U.S. Army All-American game for two decades. He was as impressive as a quarterback as I've seen in that game as anybody in the last 20 years. And we're talking, I'm watching that game all the way back to, you know, Reggie Bush really caught my eye 20 years ago in that game. So that's one where the best of the best of the high school players are playing against one another. And when you're standing out like that, I think you're a hell of a prospect. Uh, Very accurate kid, good decision-making. I think that bodes well for for the next level. Uh, Transfers, they went hot and heavy. I mean, I mentioned Slee from Kent State. They go in the the MAC uh, to the replacement for Charbonnet at running back. Carson Steele led the MAC in rushing a year ago at Ball State, over 1,500 rushing yards. I liked what I saw from Keegan Jones. 
in the bowl game. T.J. Harden's also going to be in the mix at running back. They also did a good job, UCLA did, you know, in the portal at wide receiver. J. Michael Sturdivant from Cal, very productive as a freshman a year ago, and not a good Cal offense, had 65 catches. Kyle Ford from USC should be able to, to stand out. He's not going to be competing with five or six other four- and five-star kids, so I, I look for him to stand out there. Uh, they had a bunch of productive – I know they lose guys like Jake Bobo, at wide receiver, but they had three, four guys that were very explosive. I mean, Cam Brown averaged over 15 yards per catch. Logan Loya was a kid that, that impressed me at certain times. He averaged over 15 yards per catch. The tightest kid at wide receiver, 17 yards per catch a year ago. So they got some pieces to work with um, as far as at the wide receiver position. Uh, the center, I we don't mention enough. I mean, they, very important player uh, to, to your offense don't believe me watch a starting center get ruled out of a game and see that, that that's the one non-quarterback position that sometimes we see movement in the line and you know UCLA's got a good one Duke Clemens uh, only had was responsible for one penalty and one sack a year ago uh, they are going to rely on some transfers and I worry a little bit because you're relying on a kid from Old Dominion who wasn't there in the spring he's going to be the left tackle but he's not going to arrive till the summer so I worry about that they also bring in a Purdue kid that's got a lot of starts uh, the beneficial thing though just like last year is that they got an opportunity to gel because when you're facing Coastal Carolina, San Diego State, and NC Central, an FCS team to start off, that's a pretty favorable non-conference slate, just like they had a year ago. And this is a team that San Diego State game, uh, obviously a massive one at Snapdragon Stadium when you are a member of the Mountain West and you get to host a Pac-12 member in primetime. It would be interesting to see that dynamic there. But after that non-conference schedule, they'll go to Rice-Eccles Stadium, and you'd like to think Chip Kelly, Brad, has figured out his quarterback at that point. And you do yeah. wonder if the young kid in Dante Moore will be thrown to the Wolves in a venue that we'll get to later that's often described as by a lot of Pac-12 coaches as one of the dif- most difficult places to play west of the Mississippi. Was mind-blowing to me when you look at Dante Moore's age went through spring camp as a 17 year old so not exactly uh, a guy that from an age standpoint you know has a ton of experience there but the talent no doubt unsurpassed also hard to root against a transfer running back in Carson Steele who openly talks about his pet alligator in interviews not quite sure how that works (laughs) but hey look I'm not here to judge I figure pains down in the Everglades are close to it if he wants an alligator or two he can definitely welcome inside to his home Uh, before we get to the win total Brad I'm going to come back to you on that but I want to go to the defensive side of the ball and when we look at the UCLA defense pain DeAnton Lynn comes over at 30 33 years of age, Anthony Lynn's son had been calling plays, or excuse me, had been associated with the Ravens defense the last couple of years, will be calling plays for the first time. And one of the big things that Kamari Ramsey said, and this was a quote from him, the defense as a whole is a little more aggressive. We want to get to the, the off to the offense behind the chains early. You don't want to be passive. You want to get the offense behind the stick. So I like being more aggressive. Why is that important? Because when you look at UCLA a season ago, they were the definition of a bend but don't break defense. The only team team in the FBS that didn't give up a single play over 50 yards, but ranked 110th nationally when it came to giving up gains of 10 plus yards. UCLA defense, you hope have to bounce back under new leadership, but your thoughts and prayers do go out to their former DC and the family and friends of Bill McGovern, who unfortunately passed away this offseason. Yeah, third third DC in three seasons. So that's that's interesting here. And we have seen most recently Michigan dip into the Ravens defensive staff and find success back to back hires. And, you know, Lynn was hesitant taking a college job because he spent, you know, his time in the NFL since 2014 there. I do get the vibe that players are connecting more with someone closer to their age that's played the game compared to the last two hires. You're starting to kind of hear some leaks from players and other coaches on what UCLA wants to be but Lynn clearly has you know tried to suppress some of that stuff and he wants the element of surprise there was something that kind of caught me off guard because the one thing Lynn said was he wants to eliminate big plays as a focus and you hit it perfectly in that 
They didn't allow a single 50 plus yard play all last season. And UCLA was top 35 in the country defending explosive passes, above average defending explosive runs. So I'm thinking to myself, was like, was he watching the same thing we were watching? And so that made me a little bit concerned. But again, maybe maybe playing coy. But UCLA, you know, got chunked to death. They were you know, bending and breaking uh, outside the top 110 in both rushing and passing success rate allowed. And then when opponents got into their green zone, gave up 4.7 points per trip. So I, I'm not sure what, you know, Lynn saw on film to be like, hey, eliminating big, big plays is the problem. All the signs are pointing to, to Lynn going with five defensive backs on the field again at once, right? He's going to shift between a 3-3-5 and a 4-2-5. One thing I at least did like hearing from him that he was going to use different zone coverage drops with a focus on the secondary, having their eyes forward on the quarterback and defending areas and not players. Hopefully we do see more of that aggression. And, you know, you start to look at some of, you know, the talent, a lot of returning production, top 20 in that regard. I don't necessarily love the talent in the back half, but up front, Latou and Murphy, as good as it gets, both of those dudes were, were menaces last year. Latou created a pressure on more than 20% of pass rush snaps, Murphy on 16%. And so when you think about those numbers, and then to have a defense that was outside the top 90 in both havoc and tackles for loss, it points to the scheme and the play calls not being aggressive enough. So hopefully that enhances a little bit this year. You have the addition of Jake Hamlicker, Hamlicker from, from Penn, um, three-star D end, got better each season 15 percent pressure rate on pass rush snaps at that level let's see if that continues it'd be a nice third guy to have in your rotation in the middle i'm kind of like meh right gary smith jay toya keanu williams decent trio but you know smith the best of the bunch hasn't been able to stay healthy i don't love the linebacker room femi oladejo transfers in from cal three high star backer he's been all the rave this spring right supposedly flying around didn't produce his first two seasons at Cal. And then you have uh, the Hawaii transfer that came in last season, Darius Masu. Looked like a fish out of water, supposedly. Looks more comfortable understanding Lynn's defense. The secondary hopefully improves with a defensive coordinator that's specialized in coaching the secondary at the NFL level. Again, safeties coach with the Ravens. Maybe just a different voice, a different approach to coverage. On paper, there just aren't a ton of dudes in the back end. You know, it's it's Devin Kirkwood. He's solid, plus cover guy. Alex Johnson at nickelback coming off his best season, but it was more like spot duty, like a 200 snap guy. So let's see when they put more on his plate. Jalen Davis transferred in from Oregon last season, played plus ball. Somehow, John Humphrey's in the mix to start to me. You know, he's a jag, right? Allowed 72% reception rate when targeted <laughs> and a 139 passer rating. So, I mean, maybe you get him out of the lineup. UCLA lost both starting safeties. They do bring in one of Brad's boys, the, the four-star bowling green transfer, Jordan Anderson, had a monster 2019 and 2021 seasons. If he can play to that form, while upgrading conferences like that's a huge get for the Bruins Churchill is slated to start at the other safety spot that's more of his natural position he moved to corner last year and wasn't very good but if you go back to 2021 when he was playing safety Churchill graded out a plus player I think we see some level of improvement defensively year over year I mean UCLA was 94th and in, in our adjusted metrics last year can they get into that like 65 72 range this season right below average I think would be a huge leap and it sounds like you know the defense is going to need to be at least incrementally better to make up for for what the offense you know downtrends a little bit as all right boys as far as the win total for UCLA this appears to be one that's relative relatively polarizing uh, amongst professional betters. so kind of wanted to get your take Brad first when you look at UCLA we've obviously covered the offensive and defensive side of the ball as far as their schedule what you've seen from the win total and then Payne feel free to jump in and piggyback so I did bet the over even though I got you know concerns on the offensive side of the ball and 
you know, even though I've downgraded their power rating, I mean, I'm, I'm still looking at a schedule where I project them to be more than a touchdown favorite in nine of the 12 games. Is that automatically equal to nine wins? No, but I, I was much more, much more expecting this win total to be priced in the eight and a half range, which it is at a majority of books now. So, uh, look, I made 100 win total bets. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm actually at 105 now. It wasn't one of my favorite ones, but it was enough for me to say, yeah, that, that should be – that that should not be eight. That should be more in the eight and a half range. Yeah, I, I don't. Similar sentiment with... from you, Payne, or, or when you look at this total, do you think there's a, a little bit more wiggle room as it approaches that eight and a half total? I don't ag- disagree with Brad. At eight, it's a different conversation, and this is you know one of the Pac-12 teams that decided to ultimately you know punt the non-con schedule. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the other interesting thing here is like we're going to be monitoring the shit out of this on on who the starting quarterback is because Dante Moore clearly has the highest upside, and the positive is while he's young, he was an early enrollee, so he got there in spring. He's going to have summer it's going to have parts of of you know fall camp and it's almost to your point it's like do you want to have this guy riding the bench the first three games and then all of a sudden like you have utah or do you want to get him acclimated because you believe even if he's just above average getting his feet wet he's going to learn a lot the first three games you're going to be good enough elsewhere to overcome those win them and now all of a sudden you have a little bit more of a mature quarterback heading into utah washington state oregon state games on the schedule I, so I'm going to be really interested to see that. If it's Dante Moore, the upside here is is really large. And I do believe you're going to get some type of defensive progression just based upon you know, being a little bit more aggressive and, and changing your scheme. It's something we talk about all the time. When you have a really good offense, the goal is to get them the ball back, right? Create turnovers, create negative plays. It's not to have them sit on the sideline while teams are chunking you 10 yards a clip and your offense is is getting out of rhythm on the sidelines for six minutes a pop. Like It just drives me nuts. So hopefully a little bit more aggression, a few more turnovers will, will, will help the UCLA defense and get the ball back to, to Chip Kelly's offense. Interesting to see if the Bruins can continue their momentum in their final season in the Pac-12 because life in the Big Ten won't be easier, but also interesting that when you talk about a guy in Dante Green – with ties to the Midwest, he'll get to play a lot more games in front of friends and family for the Detroit native. From UCLA to their bitter rival, the USC Trojans, who were one bad half of football and a torn hamstring for Caleb Williams away from getting into the college football playoff a season ago. You look at their win total, depending on where you shop, nine and a half with heavy juice to the over, are plenty of shops at 10 as well, and they find themselves more or less favorites to win the league at a shade less than two to one. As far as where USC came in a season ago, they won 10-plus games for the first time since 2017 behind the Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams debut. Two of their three losses were by a single point, Utah and Tulane, of course, in the bowl game and an improbable finish. The seven-win increase year-over-year tied a school record. And when you look at USC, though, one of the things that'll be more interesting to figure out if they can sustain is that turnover margin, where they led the nation at plus 21 and were plus 97 in terms of points in their ability to capitalize there as far as their schedule they do play week zero but they don't get a second buy they're actually off for thanksgiving weekend whether this serves to be a benefit should they make the pac-12 championship remains to be seen um with a week zero matchup against san jose state they'll play nine straight and beginning in mid-october with a trip to south bend that's where the schedule really starts to tighten up brad We'll go to the offensive side of the ball first, uh, a group led by offensive coordinator Josh Henson and returning Heisman Trophy winner Caleb Williams, who's obviously seeking to become just the second player ever to win the award multiple times, was the fourth quarterback in the last six years to win the Heisman after transferring to a new school. Eighth Heisman Trophy winner in USC history, the first since Reggie Bush, led the FBS in total touchdowns with 52, broke the school record for passing touchdowns and total TDs, second with 73 plays of 20-plus yards, accounted for a shade less than 5,000 yards. He's going to be the number one pick in the NFL draft. Can Caleb Williams do what he did last year and then some with what USC has surrounded him, both with skill position players and in the trenches? I think this offense can be just as good as it was a year ago. And, you know, that's saying something when you consider they lost their leading rusher, lost their leading receiver, and Jordan Addison arguably lost their top two offensive linemen that combined for 90 career starts. So the the fact that I'm still expecting this offense to not miss a beat 
says to Caleb Williams. It also says to Lincoln Riley, I mean, who continues to be, in my opinion, the best offensive mind in, in college football. And th- keep in mind, this is only the second time Lincoln Riley returns his starting quarterback. So it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, if he can add a little bit more new wrinkles. Let's start with Caleb Williams, the defending Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, he'll certainly be under more scrutiny this year. Uh, I have found in the past returning Heisman winners, you know, are a little bit more under the microscope. And, I mean, there, there's a reason there's only been one two-time winner of the award and Archie Griffin at Ohio State. So uh, there'll be some extra pressure and eyeballs on him. But, man, you got to like what he has surrounding him, starting with this position coach, Kingsbury, uh, the former Texas Tech head coach, Arizona Cardinal head coach, is the quarterback coach. Uh, another good move by Lincoln Riley there. Uh, Austin Jones replaced Travis Dye. You know, at the end of last season after Die got hurt, uh, they got some depth there. Marshawn Lloyd, they bring in from South Carolina, kind of a bowling ball k- uh, kid that gives them a little bit different dynamic that they haven't had the last couple of years. Uh, the true freshman, Quentin Joyner, he flashed to me, maybe even looked like the best running back in the spring game. So I'm expecting him to contribute. Yes, I already mentioned they lose Addison, but, man, it's a top-five wide receiver room in the entire country, maybe even top three. I think Ohio State and Washington would be the only two that I would put above them. Uh, Taj Washington's back, highly productive, over 700 yards a year ago, over 15 yards per catch. Mar- Saint- Mario Williams, 600 yards, over 15 yards per catch is back. Brendan Rice flashed at the end of last season, over 16, uh, over 600 yards, over 15 yards per catch for him as well. And then they bring in Dorian Singer, one of the best wide receivers in the Pac-12 a year ago from Arizona. He comes in uh, w- with 1,000 yards last season added to the mix. And then, you know, y- you throw in Zachariah Branch, a five-star recruit at wide receiver. Makai Lemon was a, a very high four-star, top 50 overall player in the country. Relik Brown flips from running back to slot receiver. He's a former five-star. Speaking of five-stars, something that they haven't had uh, at tight end in a lot of years under Lincoln Riley. It'll be interesting to see how they use Deuce Robinson, who was a late get, you know, a couple months even after signing day, he decides to come <laughs> in the USC. So they have as many weapons as anybody at the skill positions. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a, a, a coach in the entire country that would trade his, uh, his room uh, with Lincoln Riley's at the skill position. The question I have is on the offensive line when it comes to the offense. I mentioned the pair of starters that they lost. Uh, so there, there were certainly – when you got two guys that combine for 90 career starts, that's a lot of production. Dietz is going to move to center. He did in the bowl game to get kind of a, an early jump start to this upcoming season. Kingston and Monheim, I think, are capable of being all-conference caliber. One of the notes that I made uh, coming out of the spring game was – USC needs to go in the portal, get an offensive lineman. They need to go in the portal and get a defensive lineman. Lincoln Riley hit a home run. I mean, he got arguably the best offensive line prospect and the defense, best defensive line prospect post-spring. Pregnant from uh, Wyoming, uh, he comes in, might start right away. I mean, you always wonder about going from the Mountain West to the Pac-12, but, I mean, he's a road grader uh, that, that can contribute for them. Uh, you mentioned a little bit of the schedule. I want to mention it, too. I don't think there's a bigger disparate schedule in the entire country as far as, I mean, USC is going to be probably a 17-point favorite at minimum in each of their first six games, and then their last six games is going to rival, you know, a gauntlet that, you know, I, I'm not sure that the SEC West teams would be thrilled with USC's last six games. I mean, that's how tough that schedule is in the final six games of the year. So uh, it's going to be a highly productive offense. For the first six games, they'll enter South Bend and by far probably is the number one total offense, scoring offense in the country. And then it starts getting a lot more difficult for them at that point. If they're going to sustain the dichotomy in schedule, Brad, some of it's going to be because this defense has to be better than what we saw last year. So it's time to put Payne on the witness stand so he can Uh defend Alex Grinch here. And what Alex Grinch wasn't able to accomplish, at least in his first year as D.C. uh, at the helm of USC. This was a program that allowed 90 points in two meetings against Utah, and they were absolutely bullied in those particular matchups. No team in the final 2022 AP Top 25 rankings allowed more points per game at 29.2 or total yards per game at 423.9 than USC and you look at some of the defensive numbers 94th in points per game 
80th in rushing yards per game, 112th in passing yards per game, 106th in total yards, 8th worst in yards per plate allowed. However, they were elite when it came to havoc and turning the ball over. Top 10 in sacks and 6th with 28 turnovers forced. They obviously hit the transfer portal to try and fortify what this group would look like in the trenches. But Payne, what are your expectations for the second year leadership of Alex Grinch when it comes to the Trojan stop unit? Let me ask you this. Do you have a Twitter burner account? Because for about a decade, there's been some guy in my mentions <laughs> constantly yammering about how Alex Grinch is horrific. Is that you? I have no Twitter burner account that you speak of. I wish I did, though, because now I'm going to have to go try and track down some of these mentions. <laughs> it's it's the same it's the same tweet for like a decade. Um, you, you know, listen, I think most college football fans are delusional about their favorite team. Everything is just viewed through you know, the most optimistic lens. (laughs) And when you bring in Lincoln Riley and possibly the number one overall pick in Caleb Williams, like the delusional Trojan fans believe they'd compete for a national title year one without realizing like the prior three full seasons, five and seven, eight and five, four and eight. Payne, can you not take shots at my wife when you're doing this (laughs) breakdown when it comes to the USC Trojans, please? I'd appreciate that for the sanctity of my peace and mind at home. I think you just wanted to say that for the first time on, on this podcast, my wife. (laughs) Um, I I don't know about that. (laughs) You know, you you think about those records, too, of five and seven, eight and five and four and eight. And think about USC's main competition for recruits and like where those programs were. Texas wasn't back in any of those seasons. Oregon had multiple coaching changes. Chris Peterson left or uh, Washington. So like USC wasn't going to transform from four and eight to this fully loaded roster at every single uh, position. And, and just like be a national title contender in, in one season. And I think really because Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams were so damn good that, you know, the easy point to like the easy place to point your finger was was Alex Grinch and the Trojans defense. They, they became the punching bag. And it's I get it. It's understandable. But in reality, there was year over year defensive improvement. If you look, Alex Grinch inherited a USC defense that finished 2021 ranked 109th in schedule just efficiency. USC last year, 79th. And, you know, you just think about every big job that Alex Grinch has had. Doesn't matter which one. He's improved the defense despite coordinating a unit that had to deal with an offense that was either chuck and duck, fast-paced, or both, right? You go down the line and you look at what he did at Wazoo. That was a defense he inherited. That was 99th. By the time he left, they were top 30 defense. He spent one year at Ohio State. He kept the Buckeyes a top 25 schedule adjusted defense despite losing seven starters and returning less than 50% of the production. And, you know, returning production meant more in 2018 when it was actually difficult to transfer. Oklahoma was 84th defensively the season before Lincoln Riley hired Grinch away from Ohio State. In two seasons, Oklahoma was a top 15 schedule adjusted defense. This is never going to look perfect defensively for USC, right? It just needs to be competent enough to pair with, you know, a top seven or better offense annually. And there aren't tons of like five star defensive linemen that want to leave the South for the Pac-12 and the ones that are on the West Coast that stay on the West Coast. Right. Savelle Smalls, Corey Foreman, they end up not being those type of dudes at the college <laughs> level. Right. There's a direct correlation to why the Pac-12 won't exist fairly soon. Um, you, you look at what USC did with depth in the front seven this season. You obviously lose Thule. He got drafted in the second round. He's going to be missed. But the transfer portal felt different this offseason, right? There weren't, you know, taking backup Baylor players and hoping they'd transform the defense like they did a season ago, right? Like, you get Bear Alexander. Obviously, some locker room issues, we'll say, at Georgia. But he was a top 15 D-line recruit in the 2022 class. Anthony Lucas heads back west after taking the oil money bag at A&M for one season. He was a five-star kid in 2022. So you have the two upside talents and then veterans with proven track records and Jack Sullivan and and Keon Bars, Mason Cobb, uh, Jamal Muhammad in, in the Trojan front seven, all well above replacement level players last season. And I haven't mentioned guys like Benton and Solomon who supposedly had great springs. You still have Corey Foreman there, right? I think the hope is the front seven helps the secondary improve. And the secondary was an abomination, right? Like, let's just, there's there's no sugarcoating that. 
And when you pick off that amount of passes and the havoc that they created that you alluded to at the top, Todd, like being, you know, outside the top 100 and success rate allowed and explosive passing and EPA per pass like is is head scratching. Obviously, you know, they brought in some dudes, Christian Roland Wallace from Arizona. He's a four star transfer, solid cover corner, not elite. He is coming off a very good season where he allowed 55 percent of targets to be caught. You have, you know, Sear Wright who continues to improve. He was the talk of spring. Jacob Covington had a nice spring. You still have Damani Jackson, who is the number two corner in the 2022 class. Supposedly, he's continuing to grow. They really like what he can provide. And then you have Kalen Bullock, who was an elite cover safety last year, graded out USC's best defender. He's back. Zion Branch was a top 60 kid from the 2022 class that received praise during spring. One thing is, is pretty certain to me. Like many of the the USC transfers that they brought in last year that played a major role and that decided to stay again, they're all like second and third stringers heading into fall camp. So, you know, it's interesting to, to think about that, right? And then, you know, to me, you're going to really tell what this defense is, right? It's got to be true defensive improvement because, you know, massive turnover aggression coming interception rate was off the charts fumble luck was uh, unfathomable and then you know it's not like opposing offenses were were you know getting lucky with starting field position you know on average opposing offenses started possessions at their own 26 and a half yard line so USC isn't going to be able to trick their way into improvement this season the schedule is backloaded, as as Brad mentioned. I think there's time to get more reps under a pretty complicated Grinch scheme. The first five weeks, we're projecting offenses that USC faces to be outside the top 90 on average. And to me, like a really good season for USC's defense is making another 25 to 30 spot leap, right? Improve from 79th to somewhere in that 45 to 55 range. And I know there's actually some guys that I respect that are more optimistic with their defensive projections. So I think, again, somewhere in that 45 to 55 range is is realistic improvement. And you see what USC is doing on the trail defensively. Just landed a four-star defensive end recruit that was toying with a lot of SEC schools. So uh, this is going to take some time on the defensive side of the ball just because there's not a ton of like impact five-star dudes that are going to the Pac-12. So uh, I think you'll see improvement again this year defensively. To your point, the luxury they are afforded is an explosive offense, that a USC's defense can hold their opponents to a points per game, you know, in that three touchdown threshold or thereabouts. I mean, this USC team should score 31 points and then some, especially against some of the inferior foes early and even when they step up in class later in the year, knowing how much more difficult their schedule gets down the stretch. And it will be interesting to see if USC can do this year what they weren't able to do last year. And that's knock Utah from their perch as back-to-back Pac-12 champions. Champions. When we look at this youth program, they've become the model of stability and largely because Kyle Whittingham has been there and has become the senior statesman of all Pac-12 coaches. Utah's win total this year, eight and a half shaded to the under, and they find themselves in that six and a half to one range to win the conference. Whittingham will enter his 19th season at the helm in Salt Lake City, becoming the second longest tenured head coach at the FBS level behind only Iowa's Kirk Ferentz. When you look at the other 11 coaches in the Pac-12, they have combined for just 20 22 years of experience. The 154 wins as Utah's head coach compares to 129 combined for the other 11 coaches. As far as Utah, they've upgraded their overall recruiting profile as well. 2023's recruiting class was the first time in school history that the program finished inside the top 25 nationally. And when you talk about challenges, getting to the mountaintop can be one thing. Being able to repeat is something completely different. And as far as Utah, they finished in the AP Top 10 for the first time since 2008, the highest since joining the Pac-12. They won 10 games in three straight non-COVID seasons for the first time since joining the league and the second time in program history. Six and O at home with an average margin of victory north of 30 points per game was the third best in the FBS. They haven't lost a home game with fans at Rice Eccles Stadium since 2018. They were the fourth highest scoring home team in the country. And this is clearly a program that hasn't recruited at an ultra high level, but as they recruit better, we've seen what the talent development looks like. But Payne, for Utah coming into the 2023 season, their biggest coup may not have been recruiting players or retaining the services of Cam Rising, who will be coming back from a torn ACL, but keeping Andy Ludwig at home after flirtations and 
Brad's beloved Notre Dame <laughs> Fighting Irish oh, not geez. wanting to loosen the ties on their purse strings. Yeah, first of all, professional transition from USC to Utah. So golf clap for you there. Very good. I'm out. Um, I'm out. You guys got the rest. <laughs> Andy Ludwig was was a huge uh, retention asset. I do think this season's a little interesting for Utah, right? There's a target on their back now, back-to-back Pac-12 championships and Rose Bowl appearances. And I think what you mentioned there at the top and passing is probably where we start, and we shouldn't sugarcoat this, just rip the Band-Aid off. The two most talented and important offensive players for Utah heading into the season are Cam Rising and Brant Cuthy. Both are working their way back from serious injuries. Rising suffered a torn ACL in the Rose Bowl. So when does he return? And when he does return, keeping him clean is is pretty vital. And when you look at some of his passing metrics, like Rising is wildly efficient and accurate when you keep him clean and get him thrown with play action, you know, pretty precipitous dip otherwise. The mobility and him kind of providing that extra run dimension to Utah's offense that might be missed we don't know but you look 20 of Rising's 38 designed rushing attempts last season went for 10 or more yards had over 500 rushing yards in total and seven and a half a carry with nearly five coming after first contact he really liked to mix it up like he wasn't ducking out of bounds when he saw defenders and then you have Brant Cuthy uh, at tight end I think he's vital because Utah's receiver room is is a question mark again what feels like probably the fourth or fifth year in a row you have Dalton Kincaid go in the first round and he helped cover up that area of weakness last season and it makes me a touch nervous that on you know the final day of April Utah hits the portal for a tight end and you look at some of the receivers Devon Vele and Money Parks they have experience but I think it's fair to say that's probably one of the more lackluster lead receiver tandems in the Pac-12 you listen to Kyle Whittingham, right, comes out after spring and he's like, there's depth concerns at receiver. And then you get a first year receiver coach and Elvis Witted came out post spring and said, there's work to do. We need to find a couple more guys that can help the room. And all of a sudden you see Utah go out and they lure Micah Pittman into transferring. But he's recovering from a full labrum tear in his hip. It's at least a six month recovery process to full health and, you know, can take up to nine months for 100 percent mobility. Pittman's surgery was in the middle of March. Utah's offensive line, they get a lot of pub, and I think they were a great strength last year. Maybe that's the case again this year. They return three starters. You hear what Whittingham's saying. He comes out and says the depth's incredible, that 12 guys are competing for 10 spots on the two deep. I typically trust Whittingham with what he says. He's one of the few coaches that doesn't sugarcoat things. A lot of what he says in spring comes to fruition in fall. But the three returning starters are Keaton Bills, Mocha Fisu and uh, Leamu, right? Bills heading into year five, first season above replacement level was last year. Mocha Fisu and uh, Lemayu played below replacement level last season. Utah lost its best in Braden Daniels, a fourth round NFL pick, starting center Paul Maley transferred to BYU. I get the vibe this will be a better run blocking line than pass protecting, but I need to see what this final rotation looks like exiting fall camp. I love the running back room. Uh, you just look towards the end of the year, the light flipped on for Jaquade and Jackson down the stretch. 7.7 yards an attempt from the Wazoo game on showed great elusiveness. 10% of his carries were explosive. Jalen Glover is a guy that barely fell below the, we'll call it the take level for Florida and FSU in the 2022 class. So he signs with Utah, had a great freshman season. He's willing to get the hard, dirty yards. And then Micah Bernard tested the portal and then returned versatile guy that can provide some running value and be a pass catching back and you know flex out into the slot what's interesting here is for the first time in a while I'm a little hesitant right I'm almost always higher on Utah than market you go back the last few seasons listen to our Pac-12 previews you'll see that's evident but I have some reservations this season if you told me Cam Rising and Brant Cuthy and Micah Pittman would all be 100% for the Florida game and I know the exact starting five of the O-line my tune probably changes but Baylor and Florida in the non-con trips to Oregon State USC and Washington then Utah still has UCLA and Oregon on the schedule if Utah doesn't sweep the three non-con games they're gonna have to close seven and two down the stretch to eclipse their win total again and it and, you know, again, at Oregon State, at USC, at Washington, plus Oregon and UCLA. Very, very tough. 
It's interesting when you look at Utah and try and figure out what the recovery is going to be for Cam Rising. Clearly, Utah plans to give no indication of exactly what his availability will be uh, for that season opener in prime time, uh, the return trip against the Florida Gators. And would they elect to try and sit him if they needed to for Florida, Baylor, and Weber State, knowing that this season will be defined by, you know, getting back to that top uh, of the Pac-12 heat. But the one thing that's been interesting, some of the comments coming out, of Salt Lake City is they don't want to just be the Pac-12 champions. They want to try and compete for a college football playoff berth. Not quite sure that's going to allow it. But if there are going to be some questions and potential struggles, especially early on offensively, Brad, the defense has always been the calling card of what this program has done best. And when you look at their defensive rank since 2018, points per game, 20.1, it's the best in the Pac-12. Yards per play at 5.1, that's the best mark in the Pac-12. From a counting stat standpoint, yards per game, 319, best in the Pac-12. And they've accumulated 163 sacks during that span. Stop me if you've heard this before. That also <laughs> is the best in the Pac-12. But there are some holes to fill, probably one of the bigger ones, Clark Phillips leaving a little bit early earlier than anticipated, but there were a ton of underclassmen that stepped up last year and allowed this Utah defense that may have not as been as dynamic and tenacious as what we've seen in the years past still exceed preseason expectations. Do you think it's more of the same for Utah and some of these younger players are capable of stepping up uh, and scratching the surface of even greater potential than what we saw last year in route to a conference title? So no surprise for me, uh, you know, I'm going to repeat what you said. Uh, my expectation is Utah's defense, best in the Pac-12 this year. Uh, not only you, – you look at, obviously, historically, this has been a program on both sides of the ball, relied on culture, uh, coaching, scheme, uh, not necessarily overly talented, but their talent level is improving uh, and obviously just signed their, their highest-rated recruiting class in history. Uh, they played a bunch of so- freshmen and sophomores a year ago, and 12 of the 17 guys – who played 200 snaps on defense are back this year. Uh, if there's something that I'm most confident uh, in in the entire team, uh, you know, even counting the offense, is the defensive line. Win- Winningham even said it's as deep as they've ever been. Seven of their top eight from a year ago are back. They, they were relatively productive a year ago uh, as far as just simple counting stats. Sacks, 41. Rushing yards per game, 111. That's not too shabby. Then you dive into some of the individual talent. Uh, the Peppa kid at defensive tackles, 330 pounds. This is a big Utah team, big Utah program. I mean, they got 20 guys on the roster, 300 plus pounds. Uh, another 300 pounder, Tafuna, all Pac-12 uh, kid at, at defensive tackle. They have a couple of highly productive defensive ends. Ellis uh, at defensive end. Fillinger was a guy that m- might have been their best defensive lineman coming in the last year. He had five sacks to start off the season. Then he missed the last half of the season. That probably hurt them a little bit down the stretch. Uh, linebackers, I'm a little bit worried that they lose Diabate, but I mean, you got Lander Barton, who was one of the highest rated recruits a couple years ago in school history at linebacker. The Reed kid played a lot last year. They do bring in a Stanford transfer and, and Damuni, who had 200 plus tackles in his career. Medlock was a kid that impressed me uh, in, in that spring game. He comes over from Texas. Uh, the secondary, you mentioned it, Clark Phillips. On the other kid that was one of the more higher rated recruits in the history uh, of Utah football leaves a little bit earlier. Like you mentioned, I think they expected him back. They did go in the portal. Got a kid that, that, that's big. I mean, 6'4", 210, Miles Battle from Ole Miss. I thought he really flashed in the spring game. I'm not sure he's going to start immediately, but my goodness. I mean, I mean, he's certainly got the size and he, he looked productive in the spring game. Broughton and Vaughn are back in the back end. I like the Bishop kid at nickel. Uh, he, he's somebody that can play the run or the pass. Nine TFLs a year ago, 12 run stops. Also was productive in the, in the pass game with four PBUs and an interception. So I, I think that, you know, the, the back end, obviously, he's got a little bit more question marks in the front. But, I mean, when you pop on every single year, the Utah spring game, they just look so different than any other Pac-12 team as far as the physicality aspect and – Man, that front defensive line, a lot of the Pac-12 teams are going to struggle with it. But with that being said, I'm going to echo the same sentiments as Payne. Uh, typically, I, I want to run to the window to bet Utah over because I just don't think they get properly priced in the marketplace. They're, they're better than they play above their means as far as talent level and what they look like on paper. But 
I'm really concerned about the, the the injuries on the offense, but I'm probably most concerned is this arguably is the toughest schedule in the history of Utah football when you throw in Florida and Baylor in the non-conference, plus a much improved uh, Pac-12 conference as a whole, and you're playing all the big boys. Uh, you, you're playing the Oregons and the Washingtons from, from, from the former North Division. So, uh, man, if you're not completely healthy, uh, I, and you're a two-time defending uh, Pac-12 champ with a bull, bullseye on your back. I could see Utah being a team that may, maybe takes a little bit of a step back this year. Be an interesting program to watch. I mean, they've raised the bar on what their expectations are, have become in Salt Lake City. We'll see if they're able to continue to perform at that high level. Or to your, both your gentlemen's points, they do take a step back uh, because there is a lot more competition within the conference as a whole. And part of the reason there's been more competition in the conference is because of what we saw unfold last year in Seattle and Kalen DeBoer's first season controlling the Washington Huskies. He'll enter his second year for a Huskies team that finds themselves with big expectations. Their win total sits at nine and a half, albeit shaded to the under. They find themselves at most books third favorites behind USC and Oregon to win the conference. Obviously exceeded expectations last year, finishing in a second place tie in the Pac-12 standings and a number eight ranking in the final Associated Press poll. They finished the season as the highest ranked Pac-12 school for the first time since 2000 and made their first bowl appearance since 2019. Normally we start with the offense, but I want to keep Payne on the sidelines for a little bit, Brad, before he professes his love for Michael Penix and the fact that he identified him way back when when he was... calling plays uh, at Indiana so we can start with Washington on the defensive side of the ball Uh, and this is a group that ended up 100th in the country when it came to defending the pass they were 111th nationally in opponent passing efficiency rating and 129th with just 2.54 passes defended per game we expected a little bit of a drop off when you're trying to replace NFL caliber talent in the likes of Kyler Gordon and Trent McDuffie But this season, they obviously went out, they hit the transfer portal, they brought in some names. As far as power ratings and expectations, can this Washington defense approve on what we saw last year, knowing that the offense is most definitely going to do its part? Should, uh, from a talent uh, aspect. And let me mention Kalen DeBoer, uh, I think is a maybe top 10 coach in the country. Doesn't get, you know, the the respect he, he deserves, but that's okay. I mean, you can, you know, bet... Keep betting on him against the spread and win totals and whatnot, and he can continue to exceed expectations. But when you look at the overall talent level, I know they're an offensive-driven team a year ago, but it still didn't explain them to, to be 98th in success rate allowed on defense, 115th in turnover rate, 109th in havoc rate. Uh, they were improved on the stretch now, I, I will mention. I mean, just a basic counting stat scoring. I mean, first six games against FBS teams, they allowed 32 points per game. Last six, less than 23. So there was a little bit of improvement. Can it be a top 40, top 50 defense? I think so. And, and look, they started to flash a little bit even the spring game. When you're facing one of the best offenses in the country, I don't care you know, how, how much Penix is playing and whatnot, but certainly you would expect the offense to have a significant edge over the defense. That's not what I saw. Most of the spring game, the defense had the edge. And it starts in that defensive line, which was a strength. If there was one strength on defense a year ago, it was a defensive line. I mean, they were pretty good against the run. They had 37 sacks. They do lose Jeremiah Martin. Uh, who was productive eight and a half sacks a year ago, but I like the Braylon Trice kid, pro football focus, rated him as the national leader in pressures, 67. I didn't misspeak there, 67 pressures from PFF last year. I mean, basic math, what is that, six a game? My goodness, nine sacks for him. Uh, I like their defensive tackles. Tuatelli is a 300-pounder. Leitu uh, Legasinoa, another 300-pounder, uh, had 16 run stops a year ago. I, you know, if ZTF can finally be healthy, when he's healthy, he's uh, one of the better pass rushers in the Pac-12, 12, 12 and a half sacks in his career. I like the linebackers. You mentioned that they went out and got a transfer from USC and go for it. He's got 147 career tackles. Tuputala was their second leading tackler a year ago. He's back. Uh, another kid that's been banged up battling injuries his entire career, but when he's healthy, uh, he, he's as good as anybody in the Pac-12, that Ula Foshio uh, at linebacker for him. So, I think the front seven has the talent and the depth to be much better than what they were a year ago. There's still a question mark for me. It's on the past D that they lose their top, at least their leader and Alex Cook 
and this was a pass defense that gave up 26 touchdowns and only had seven interceptions a year ago. They went out in the portal, got a kid from Oklahoma State and Jabbar Muhammad. He was one, a former four-star kid that was probably Oklahoma State's best defensive back a year ago. Asa Turner's a safety, was a high four-star kid when he came out of high school. He's played a lot. A uh, ton of experience. He's probably one of their better back guys uh, uh, on the back end. But I, I think on the whole, this is a Washington defense that, you know, if they can get up to that top 40, top 50 level like they should, especially up front, I mean, and then you combine that with what Payne's going to talk about on the offense side of the ball, got a damn good-looking football team. Yeah, top 40, if that's a realistic expectation for this team defensively, the sky could become the limit for an offense that should be top five in the country again, at least you'd hope, with Michael Penix back to lead the charge as they boasted the number two offense in the country a year ago, averaging a little bit more than 515 yards per contest, a shade less than 40 points per game, and an FBS best, 369.8 passing yards per contest. Penix returns uh, after throwing for basically the line share of all of those yards we saw exactly what he's capable of doing when he's kept from in a clean pocket there are a bevy of receivers to be excited about with a pair of thousand yard receivers returning in Roma Dunzier and Jalen McMillan the only other team that returns a pair would be Ohio State as far as what they elected to do in the transfer portal brought in some running back depth but Payne, the floor is yours to talk about what we should see in Ryan Grubb's second season as offensive coordinator with Michael Penix there working the controls. Well, the first thing's obvious. I gave Brad the defense because he was uh, going to have to pronounce all those names. Uh, and he did a fantastic <laughs> job doing that. Um, you didn't you know you didn't know Brad is fluent in American Samoan <laughs> to try and be able it. to he, get he through everything that. in the Pac-12. <laughs> that was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and to his point, like we're we're projecting right now, forty sixth for for Washington's defense this season. So I agree with him on a on a tick up. But overall, it's just like. You know, what a difference a year makes. You know, you fire Jimmy Lake and tell him to take his condescending run the damn ball merchandise with him. And all of a sudden you you hire a great offensive mind in Kalen DeBoer and, you know, have him reunite with his former Indiana quarterback, Michael Penix Jr. And those two were just outstanding, right? I think we thought it would be good. No one thought it would be that good. Um, you know, you, you get this young, talented receiver group that a lot of people had question marks about coming into last year, and we're like, "There's, there's a ton of talent here." And then DeBoer and Penix just allowed that group to flourish, and in virtually 12 months, you know, you resurrect a program, and you have you know an offense that finished number one in schedule adjusted EPA per play. So, recruiting is is vital, but but coaching still matters. Penix returns obviously he had the most cumulative EPA of any quarterback in the country last season more than Caleb Williams more than Drake May he was extremely effective pushing the ball to the intermediate and deep parts of the field Penix had almost a four to one big time throw rate to turnover worthy play rate he's going to have his top three receivers back with Rome McMillan and Polk Rome averaged over two and a half yards per route run McMillan 2.3 and then Polk one of the best wide receivers threes in the country there's solid depth behind that that trio as well and then I thought DeBoer went out and upgraded the the running back room plucked four-star Dylan Johnson from an SEC school out of the portal Cam Davis is back with his 13 touchdowns tackle position one of the best in the Pac-12 with uh, Troy Fontenot and then Rosengarten both those guys return if you look at what they did when they were on the field combined right 1,218 pass block snaps for those two guys. Neither allowed a sack. Just a 2.5% pressure rate combined. Obviously, you know, you're sitting in the shotgun and uh, Penix does a good job getting the ball out quick, but those are just staggering numbers. I think the one question mark for Washington's offense this season is the interior of the offensive line. You lost your center, both starting guards, and they weren't Jags, right? All of them. Kirkland, uh, Benavalu, and Luciano performed exceptionally well, especially in pass blocking. Their grades all averaged somewhere from 80 to 85. Again, 60 is replacement level. All three are currently on NFL rosters. Now, scheme and fit matter, 
and I think DeBoer will get more out of linemen because of that than what's on the surface, but I do believe the interior is a little bit of a question mark. Brad mentioned how the D-line was, you know, I wouldn't say dominating, but certainly keeping up with the offense, and, and a lot of that pressure and a lot of the run stuffs were coming from the interior, so something to look for. I think fall camp will you know, determine who starts uh, on the interior. You have Melee, who's probably got the inside track to start at center, about 300 snaps the last two seasons in backup roles, but he's graded out a plus player. Both guard positions look like fall camp battles, so I'm keeping an eye on that between Kaleppo and Hatchet and, and Belo. And then late in the portal process, Washington added Jalen Clem, a four-star lineman from the 2022 class. So there's going to be some competition on the interior, so I know Brad will be much monitoring that as well as we will um washington's schedule projects to be much tougher than last season if you look just kind of on the surface out of the shoot right it's it's kent state and portland state get replaced by boise and tulsa and then rather than hosting michigan state you know washington's traveling to the midwest and then usc gets added to the schedule and it's on the road from an offensive perspective, Washington faced a schedule of defenses that had an average efficiency rank last year of 82nd. This season, we're projecting a little bit of a leap to 58. So, you know, uh, an increase there in difficulty for sure. I'm not sure we're going to see, you know, Penix be the number one cumulative EPA guy. I'm not sure this is the number one offense, but if you're somewhere in like the top seven and you get that defensive improvement, I mean, Washington's going to be damn good again. Hey, a lot of reasons to be excited about a sleeping giant, so to speak. What was once a proud program in the Pacific Northwest that had fallen on some hard times, maybe building back to that level of stability, uh, an annual competition within the Pac-12, especially knowing that USC and UCLA will be out of the league and there's no reason that Washington can't become the gold standard when you have an offensive mind as talented as Kalen DeBoer with or without Michael Penix, obviously going forward, knowing he's got one season left and they'll do everything they can to keep him upright and allow him to replicate the strong season that we saw last year from west to east though in the apple cup rivalry it's the washington state cougars and when you look at the cougs win total six and a half which suggests bowl eligibility by the slimmest of margins shaded to the under but they are long shots to win the league at a price of 65 to 1 Last season for Washington State, all six losses were against teams that finished ranked in the final AP poll. This was a group that was 0-6 when they allowed more than three touchdowns in a game. There was a change in coordinator, and they lost a ton of guys at various position coaches as well. They were gutted by the transfer portal, but are fortunate to bring back their most important player in starting quarterback Cam Ward. Brad, when we look at this Washington State offense, one of the more intriguing hires they made was in terms of who they named at offensive coordinator at, as Ben Arbuckle. The 27-year-old enjoyed a meteoric rise in the coaching profession, uh, been an assistant coach for just one season when he was the co-offensive coordinator at Western Kentucky. But Jake Dyker was extremely optimistic and said this is the kind of young, innovative mind that they essentially need to take this football program back to the high standards of offensive efficiency that Mike Leach had built there with the air raid. When you look at Wazoo offensively, is there reason to be optimistic that this team can be significantly more explosive than the plotting attack that we saw more often than Cougars fans wanted to a season ago? Yeah, I, I definitely think so, and I expect that to be the case. You mentioned Arbuckle from Western Kentucky. I mean, if there was two coordinators in all of college football watching the spring games that caught my eye that I wasn't necessarily over-familiar with, Arbuckle was one of them. The other would have been the defense coordinator of Florida and Austin Armstrong, two kid, you know, kid, I'm going to call them kids because, hell, they're, they're more than a decade yeah, to my junior <laughs> as far as age. So, uh yeah, I, I, and I liked what I saw in the spring game. I, I mean, for a young kid making a, a step up in competition with a new offensive scheme, uh, especially when you got a quarterback in Cam Ward that's throwing the, you know, loses his top four wide receivers, they looked like they'd been in the system for multiple seasons from what I saw in the spring game. And let's talk about Cam Ward. Uh, it was okay coming from Incarnate Ward last year. I don't think he lived up to expectations. I, I think myself and some other people had a little bit higher expectations than what he put on the field. A lot of it had to do with the fact that w he wasn't explosive. I mean, this was only a, a team that completed, you know, 10.1 yards per completion. Uh, Ward held on to the football too much, 46 sacks. Uh, Washington State allowed. Now, he is the first returning quarterback starter here since Luke Falk, uh, you know, going back five, six years ago. So I just thought he looked comfortable, looked like a returning 
quarterback in the spring game. He's 12 out of 16, 259 yards, four touchdowns, and just six possessions. So looked very, you know, accustomed and comfortable in the new scheme. I do like the running back position. I know that the the air raid spread attack that that Arbuckle's going to run is going to get most of the pub, but they do have two productive guys at running back. Watson had over 700 yards a year ago. I like the Jenkins kid as a backup. He's got some quick twitch and wiggle from what I've seen on tape. Uh, Let's talk about the wide receivers, though. I, I think when, when you know returning production, like like Payne mentioned, isn't the same as what it was just four or five years ago. And typically, I'd be very worried with the team that loses their top four wide receivers from a year ago. I'm not in this case. Uh, you know, they went in the transfer portal, did a really good job, bringing in Josh Kelly from Fresno State. He had a thousand plus yards in his career. Kyle Williams from UNLV, over 1,500 receiving yards in his career. If there was a kid that I, I thought really flashed in the spring game, it was the, the Juco kid, D.T. Uh, Sheffield, a Juco kid that, that, that I think is going to be highly productive for them. So what I did see, you mentioned it, saw a ton more vertical routes, a lot more shots down the field. I would expect this offense to be much more explosive. And hopefully, you know, for that to be the case, I mean, Cam Ward's going to have to be protected more. And, and you know, they, a lot of production back on the offensive line. They return four starters. And maybe their best player is probably the newcomer, the Juco kid that they're really high on, and Pole so on the offensive line. So this is an offense that uh, that I did upgrade, even with a very young coordinator and, and a lot of wide receivers gone. Defensively, Payne, when you look at Jeff Schmetting and what he accomplished at Auburn last year, wasn't exactly a guy that I'm sure was on the top of most programs' wish list. Uh, spent the past two seasons down there, and inherits a solid defense that gave up uh, just less than 23 points per game. Most of the defensive difference makers didn't play in the spring game, though, for more than a series or two. It was a program that was fifth in the FBS in takeaways the last two seasons with 50, and they've become a top five in defensive raking for a lot of key categories since Jake Diker took over. Um, what's fascinating about this group is we've always associated Washington State with a high-powered offense. We've seen the DNA change a little bit, uh, but with Ben Arbuckle coming to lead the offense and a returning quarterback, there's reason to be optimistic that the offense can carry a little bit more of the water. But as far as defensive expectations this year, how do you see things playing out in the Palouse? I think it kind of returns to the old form. Right, you guys have been mentioning Ben Arbuckle, and I understand he's like super young. But you think about all these young coaches being hired now; it's like they grew up in the analytics era. So if you're looking to have an offense in the year 2023, like this is why all these young guys are being hired now. Defensively, you mentioned Jeff Schmetting; he comes over, returns to Washington, and that happens because Kenny Dillingham picked off Brian Ward to be his DC at Arizona State, which is a damn good hire. Schmetting is is from the Brian Harson coaching tree, spent two seasons as Boise's D.C., and then was promoted from Auburn's linebacker coach to D.C. last year. If you look at what Schmetting did in his two years at Boise, the defense saw minimal improvement. And then year over year from 2021 to 2022 under Schmetting, uh, Auburn went from like a top 20 defense to a fringe top 70 unit. Massive decline. Obviously, you know, some other – things at play there it wasn't you know completely on on Schmetting it was just a a full-blown disaster there defensive end is where Wazoo's horses are you have Ron Stone you have Brennan Jackson they were both voted second team all pack 12 80 pressures between them last season Quinn Roth is the third man in that DN rotation actually graded out better than Stone and Jackson Smith Wade the top cover corner uh, returns for Wazoo a couple SEC teams were we're poking around there, trying to lure him away. If you look at Smith Wade, allowed a reception on just 55% of targets and created double-digit havoc plays to just one touchdown allowed. He was the Cougars' best defensive player last season. Hicks and Lockett returned at safety. Both are plus players, but I think you need another level out of them this season. And then, you know, you kind of hear and read some of the strides the secondary has made and then I watch the spring game and I'm like I I don't really see that um you know (laughs) we'll see what that means when you know you're facing really good passing offenses in the Pac-12 if you look Wazoo is outside the top 100 in EPA per pass allowed last season I think there's question marks still heading into fall about cornerback two and who's going to man the slot I think if you look at you know the reason 
you know those guys didn't play a lot in the spring game defensively is because there are some depth concerns I think the other specific question area of Wazoo's defense is up the middle a little soft on the interior of the D-line and linebacker you have Gusta uh, probably the best on the inside but he's slightly better than replacement level you have a running mate inside with Milani who's heading into season four never been a replacement level player wazoo added a little bulk late in the portal with the 300 pounder naeem rodman from colorado a three-star defensive tackle but i think it's it's pretty bleak on the interior and then you combine that with wazoo losing its top three linebackers and and it's going to spell some trouble hanley was drafted by the chargers uh, with the 85th pick and then Mayugo went to play at miami with his brother Travion Brown followed the the former DC to Arizona State and I just I don't think there's any way when I look at this roster that that Wazoo is going to finish top 15 in defensive line yards allowed again this season you look at some of the guys they brought in and it's just like I don't know they're, they're, they're jags right from from larger programs that got no burn that weren't actually vying for for starting linebacker roles there if you watched Wazoo spring game the linebacker groom you know group just looked totally lost defending rpos so i think that's a massive question mark for me and then you know just you look at the all-encompassing defense here it's just like i think they take a step back like they were a fringe top 25 unit last year it would not be the least bit shocking to see this unit fall somewhere in like the 45 to 55 range that's that's really where we're projecting things for wazoo's defense wouldn't shock me in the least, obviously. Not a program that we've grown accustomed to consistently putting up gaudy defensive numbers. Uh, when we look at Washington State's schedule, they'll get tested right out of the gates. Not necessarily week one where they'll go to Fort Collins, albeit a revenge game of sorts for Rams team. That was that might be closer than expected. I, I was going to say. Hint, hint. For, there was some market movement on that. For, yeah, well, <laughs> look, as somebody that was sitting on Colorado State first half last year in that particular spot, I wouldn't mind to be oh. able to get my pound of flesh back. <laughs> In, in, that was tough sled. Yeah, in, in this particular <laughs> spot, Brad. Um, but Wisconsin the second week, a home game against Northern Colorado before things will pick up considerably with the home date against Oregon State leading into their bye week in the second half of the season. But no doubt, an interesting program up there in Pullman, not one of the easiest places to recruit. So being able to develop an offensive identity, I think, can go a long way. One final team, guys. Uh, that I want to highlight, albeit nowhere near the level of depth that we've covered the first eight teams that we've gone through, is what's transpiring down in Tucson with Jed Fish entering his third season there, uh, calling the shots for the Arizona Wildcats. I mean, this is a program whose win total is now sitting at four and a half, 300 to one long shots to win the conference. I know that win total is down a touch. It was interesting when you read some of Jed Fish's comments as his two goals in 2023 are to sell out all six home games and play in a bowl game, something Arizona hasn't done since 2017. The bowl game feels a bit ambitious, at least on the surface, but there's no doubt this was a program that was a lot more competitive last year than what we'd seen in the past. Five wins last season actually equaled the total from the previous three years. Three of five wins, however, did come by six points or less, so some of the narrow margins there were but they did win as many road games as they had in the previous four seasons and highlighted by a win in the territorial cup against arizona state the first time since 2016 brennan carroll the offensive coordinator yes son of pete carroll there uh gave this group a pulse in the passing game Jaden delora coming back was top six in a lot of key metrics however he did throw the most interceptions in the league it was a lot of boomer bust potential with 66 passing plays covering 20 plus yards and you saw what he could be at his absolute best when they went on the road to westwood and upset ucla as three touchdown underdogs clearly though a changing of the guard as far as some of the skill positions are concerned lose dorian singer that brad highlighted earlier when we talked about usc but they still do have jacob cowing who led the conference in receptions but may not even be the most talented receiver uh when you look at mcmillan and what he could do to assert himself as a true number one tanner mclaughlin you know one of the conference's better tight ends and a decent running back room uh that we'll see if they're able to carve out some space behind an offensive line as far as defensively look you can only go one direction 
uh, if you're Arizona. They return just a few starters on a defense that allowed 36.5 points per game. Uh, which was 126 in the FBS, so probably a good thing. Some of their other metrics, 124th in rushing yards per game, 125th in total yards per game, 126 in yards per play, 125th in getting off the field on third downs, and they allowed 30-plus points in eight games. They ended up going 1-7 and seven in those contests and were not able to force turnovers at all. Five leading tacklers from the team that allowed – you know, 37 points per game, exhausted their eligibility or transferred out. So a lot of different faces there. One of the bigger transfers, we'll see if Justin Flo, one of Payne's favorite guys over the last couple of years previewing Oregon's defense, can finally realize some of his potential. A lot of optimism about Ephesians Prysock, a cornerback that they're talking about as a game changer down there. But Brad, when you look at the state of the program for Jed Fish in Arizona, clearly this was a group that bottomed out under Kevin Sumlin's leadership. They're trending in the right direction, but oftentimes we see two steps forward, one step back, and this, at least for me, as far as their win total is concerned, feels like it could be a step back before they take a major step to bowl eligibility next year. Couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, they, they certainly overachieved, and then some last year, getting the five wins. And, and when you look at the schedule this year, when when your you know the toughest games are all at home, and, and some of your winnable games like a Washington State, a Colorado, and Arizona State all fall on the road. Uh, Stanford, I'll throw in there as well. Uh, it, it, it might be you know a team that a little bit better in my power rating uh, than than what they were a year ago, but might not necessarily reflect in the win loss record. I mean watching the spring game i mean obviously this is a high scoring team a year ago uh when you just basic counting stats you got a number 20 total offense and a number 124 total defense and when you look at returning production and talent level i think that you can mention that that gap is just as wide if not wider this year comparing their offense to their defense i like a lot of their offensive personnel i think the mclaughlin kids are best tight end since gronkowski i think he'll get end up drafted probably top three four rounds in the draft but uh I like what Fish is doing. I mean, I had my doubts uh, because he was a journeyman coach and been everywhere in a 15, 20-year period. But he's doing, done a really good job recruiting. His, his forte on the offense side of the ball has been productive. He's just got to figure out a way to, to get the defense better. I will say, though, I think he benefited from all the turmoil that was going on in Arizona State. And I think Arizona State went out and made a really good hire. So uh, that competition in state just got a hell of a lot tougher in just a year period. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be very interesting to watch some of those recruiting battles that we'll see unfold uh, in the state of Arizona, knowing how talent rich that area can be in and around Phoenix. If kids want to make the short 90 minute commute to Tucson and play for fish or if they want to stay closer to home, should those two coaches be able to reap the benefits from, you know, an area that's provided a, a lot of prospects that have filled other rosters through the Pac-12 and, and other spots within the country. So Arizona, a team to watch, may not be able to realize its full potential as far as win total is concerned, but could be a fun team knowing they may score a lot of points and give up even more on the defensive side of the ball in 2023. You can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers 7. You can follow Payne there as well at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me on Twitter. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And if you haven't already done so, encourage all of you ladies and gentlemen out there to go back and listen to some of the preview podcasts that we've already done. Every group of five conference previewed in depth. You're not going to find that level of information anywhere, especially from a guy uh, that's bet more than 100 win total so far in Brad Powers. Also, we did the ACC and the Big Ten. We still have the Big 12 and SEC to get to uh, before we close the book on the college football preview series. But if you're still not ready to dive into those, you have sports memorabilia and cardboard chat. Pain Insider does an outstanding standing job uh, with minority owner of PWCC Marketplace, Jesse Craig, talking about how cards can be a great alternative investment strategy, not only for sports bettors, but for those folks that have an enthusiasm towards their favorite players. And if you're looking to try and get involved each and every week until football starts in earnest, stay green. A look at the NASCAR race each and every weekend. We also offer up a race day best bet that you can find on the website. Speaking of best bets, gentlemen, I'm not sure who's going to take the reins here. I know last week we went a little bit off script in the Big Ten going into the group of five. Not quite sure what you two have in store for us today. So either one of you who'd like to step up to the plate, by all means, go for it. Brand go ahead, Payne. This okay. is your boy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's uh, 
probably not going to be well received. Um, I I love <laughs> Kenny Dillingham, obviously massive hire for Arizona State, as Todd just alluded to. I think the players have clearly bought in already. If you're listening to some of the comments coming out of spring and summer, but it's year one and the Pac-12 that you know we've talked about this entire time is is much improved, and I think this has a lot to do with schedule. Oklahoma State and Fresno State in the non-con. USC, Washington, Utah, UCLA, and Oregon in conference have to play a coin flip game against Cal. That's on the road. So I'm just not quite sure Arizona State is going to get to five wins, let alone eclipse it. Offensive line looks to be a problem. It was all spring. One of the players brought in via the portal to start was Ben Coleman. He suffered what is likely a season-ending injury. The best unit on the team is is the wide receiver group, but if there's questions yeah. at quarterback and protecting said quarterback, it's it's tough to get the most out of your best position group defensively lots of transfers you're hearing whispers that the d-line dominated all spring is the d-line actually good or is it a byproduct of facing a weak o-line and that's you know we talked off air a little bit but a big question we had at florida state in the early stages of Ken- kenny dillingham's tenure there it's like the secondary looked amazing in spring and then you realized once games actually started the receiver group was just dog shit you look at some of the defense like Clayton Smith and and Prince Dorba, like they're getting lots of spring hype along the D-line. And listen, they're pedigree guys, but Prince has played 78 snaps in three seasons at Texas. It's not like Texas has had elite defenses. Clayton Smith played, you know, at Oklahoma, only 110 snaps in two seasons. He's a former high four-star recruit. Let's see if you can, you know, get that potential out of him. I just think it's a ton to ask with the current quarterback situation, the O-line, the schedule for for Kenny Dillingham to get the Sun Devils to six wins in a bowl game. So let's go under five minus a dollar thirty five. Brad, feel free to uh to join. Yeah, I'm gonna start a quarterback. I mean if it's Drew Pine or Trenton Borgay, um, right now it looks like it probably is Drew Pine. I'm not a fan of Drew Pine and I see, you know, reading just the, the publications, they mention his great stats at Notre Dame. Obviously I'm familiar with Notre Dame. I watched every snap Drew Pine made last year. Uh, he was much worse than those stats. I mean, I think a big reason why Tommy Reese is now the offense coordinator at Alabama is he, you know, produ- produ- somehow produced with Drew Pine at quarterback. I mean, uh, to me, a Mac level quarterback. So I, I, I'm not in love with the quarterback outside a wide receiver. I'm not really in love with, with any of the personnel on this team. And unlike, you know, this is a, a program that because of Colorado getting all the publicity of all the transfers, Arizona State's, you know, the second most as far as turnover in a roster this year. 50 new players, counting the freshmen. 30 transfers, 20 freshmen, 50 new players. And unlike Colorado, I don't think that there's massive upgrades at every single one of these positions. They lost some key guys, particularly on defense at the linebacker position. I mean, legitimate guys. So uh, I didn't massively upgrade Arizona State, even though I absolutely love the higher long term. And then you look at the schedule. When you got him a clear favorite in one game, uh, the FCS game, the opener, you got him a double-digit underdog in five games. The question becomes: in those remaining seven, you know, in those remaining six games, they're going to have to go five and one to, to beat you. Uh, four and two is a push. Uh, I just, I don't see it here for, for the Sun Devils. Even though I like Dillingham, I this is one that I I ran to the window and bet immediately under five, and we're still sitting here at five and. I'm happy to, to give this one out. So good job, Payne, for getting me on this hey, one. Last thing, guys, and I'll open it up to both of you before we close the book on Arizona State and the Pac-12 in general. Do you believe that this is a program that can get turned around in the new look Pac-12 and can become the gold standard down there? Knowing that, and I believe the quote, and I may butcher it, so I apologize for the opposing Pac-12 coach in Athlon that said, <laughs> this is one of the easiest places to recruit players to, but it may be one of the most difficult to try and keep them eligible. Do we think Kenny Dillingham can install all that level of discipline <laughs> and allow these guys to get to be a perennial eight, nine, maybe even a 10 win program. The f- first bits of sentiment from out that way is it's understood. It's easy to get players in. There's a lot of uh, distractions out that <laughs> way. And Kenny likes to have fun. However, it's come with, a lot more physicality and practices it's come with a lot more responsibility because you know he's from the norvell staff they really take an onus in making sure kids are going to class and so that's one thing that we've seen at florida state the gpa has risen all of that stuff so i think there's a good mix that kenny dillingham's going to have there but 
in totality, when you ask that question, like, what is Arizona State going to be? What is the Pac-12 going to be? What is the college landscape going to be? So if we, you know, move and transition to where there's just like two conferences or like a top 60 school type thing, sure, he can have some success, but it's going to be relative to success, right? I think, yeah. you know, what are those teams? Eight, nine win teams when ASU was at their best? Yeah, I mean, thereabouts with uh, the likes of Jake Plummer leading the charge. Well, and how some far are you going back? Names. Frank Cush would be- beg to differ. 8-9 was not good enough for Frank yes, Cush. Yes, I'm talking semi. That's 60s. Semi, <laughs> yeah, semi. Yeah. <laughs> when we were born, when we were all alive on Earth. Hey, I mean, no co- we'll figure all <laughs> we'll figure all of it out. I mean, it's always interesting when you look at the landscapes of these conferences. I mean, we talked at the top of the show about how the Pac-12 would look significantly different uh, going forward. As this will be the final iteration that we get of the league and the way it has looked for the last 13 years. So some of the teams left behind will either step up to the plate or will they become completely irrelevant in the national landscape? That remains to be seen. Gentlemen, we have covered a ton of ground, as always, here, breaking down the Pac-12, the Big 12, the topic of discussion next week for us. Uh, Anything else you'd like to get off your chest before we close up shop? I'm good. All right. On that note, then, we're not letting Payne get a word in edgewise here. Uh, For Brad Powers, Payne Insider, I'm Todd Furman. Be sure to follow the Bet the Board podcast on Twitter. Uh, And most importantly, with an Arizona State regular season win total under the posted total at five, we'll see you at the window. Thanks for listening to Bet the Board. You can catch Todd and Payne every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday during football season, breaking down the biggest NFL and college football games. And to make sure you don't miss any free best bets, subscribe to Bet the Board on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.